Solomon son of David took a firm grip on the reins of his kingdom. God was with him and gave him much help. Solomon addressed all Israel, the commanders and captains, the judges, every leader, and all the heads of families. Then Solomon and the entire company went to the worship center at Gibeon, that's where the tent of meeting of God was, the one that Moses the servant of God had made in the wilderness. The chest of God, though, was in Jerusalem, David had brought it up from Kiriath Jerim, prepared a special place for it, and pitched a tent for it. But the bronze altar that Bezalel son of Uri, the son of Hur, had made was in Gibeon, in its place before the tabernacle of God, and that is where Solomon and the congregation gathered to pray. Solomon worshipped God at the bronze altar in front of the tent of meeting, he sacrificed a thousand whole burnt offerings on it. That night God appeared to Solomon. God said, What do you want from me? Ask. Solomon answered, You were extravagantly generous with David my father, and now you have made me king in his place. Establish, God, the words you spoke to my father, for you've given me a staggering task, ruling this mob of people. Yes, give me wisdom and knowledge as I come and go among this people, for who on his own is capable of leading these, your glorious people? God answered Solomon, This is what has come out of your heart, you didn't grasp for money, wealth, fame, and the doom of your enemies, you didn't even ask for a long life. You asked for wisdom and knowledge so you could govern well my people over whom I've made you king. Because of this, you get what you asked for, wisdom and knowledge. And I'm presenting you the rest as a bonus, money, wealth, and fame beyond anything the kings before or after you had or will have. Then Solomon left the worship center at Gibeon and the tent of meeting and went to Jerusalem. He set to work as king of Israel. Solomon collected chariots and horses, 1400 chariots and 12,000 horses. He stabled them in the special chariot cities as well as in Jerusalem. The king made silver and gold as common as rocks, and cedar as common as the fig trees in the lowland hills. His horses were brought in from Egypt and Cilicia, specially acquired by the king's agents. Chariots from Egypt went for fifteen pounds of silver and a horse for about three and three quarters of a pound of silver. Solomon carried on a brisk horse trading business with the Hittite and Aramean royal houses. Solomon gave orders to begin construction on the house of worship in honor of God and a palace for himself. Solomon assigned 70,000 common laborers, 80,000 to work the quarries in the mountains, and 3,600 foremen to manage the workforce. Then Solomon sent this message to King Hiram of Tyre, Send me cedar logs, the same kind you sent David my father for building his palace. I'm about to build a house of worship in honor of God, a holy place for burning perfumed incense, for setting out holy bread, for making whole burnt offerings at morning and evening worship, and for Sabbath, new moon, and holy day services of worship, the acts of worship required of Israel. The house I am building has to be the best, for our God is the best, far better than competing gods. But who is capable of building such a structure? Why, the skies, the entire cosmos, can't begin to contain him. And me, who am I to think I can build a house adequate for God, burning incense to him is about all I'm good for. I need your help, send me a master artisan in gold, silver, bronze, iron, textiles of purple, crimson, and violet, and who knows the craft of engraving, he will supervise the trained craftsmen in Judah and Jerusalem that my father provided. Also send cedar, cypress, and algum logs from Lebanon, I know you have lumberjacks experienced in the Lebanon forests. I'll send workers to join your crews to cut plenty of timber, I'm going to need a lot, for this house I'm building is going to be absolutely stunning, 
a showcase temple. I'll provide all the food necessary for your crew of lumberjacks and loggers, 130,000 bushels of wheat, 120,000 gallons of wine, and 120,000 gallons of olive oil. Hiram king of Tyre wrote Solomon in reply, It's plain that God loves his people, he made you king over them. He wrote on, Blessed be the God of Israel, who made heaven and earth, and who gave King David a son so wise, so knowledgeable and shrewd, to build a temple for God and a palace for himself. I've sent you Hiramabi, he's already on his way, he knows the construction business inside and out. His mother is from Dan and his father from Tyre. He knows how to work in gold, silver, bronze, iron, stone, and wood, in purple, violet, linen, and crimson textiles, he is also an expert engraver and competent to work out designs with your artists and architects, and those of my master David, your father. Go ahead and send the wheat, barley, olive oil, and wine you promised for my work crews. We'll log the trees you need from the Lebanon forests and raft them down to Joppa. You'll have to get the timber up to Jerusalem yourself. Solomon then took a census of all the foreigners living in Israel, using the same census-taking method employed by his father. They numbered 153,600. He assigned 70,000 of them as common laborers, 80,000 to work the quarries in the mountains, and 3,600 as foremen to manage the work crews. So Solomon broke ground, launched construction of the house of God in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, the place where God had appeared to his father David. The precise site, the threshing floor of Arauna the Jebusite, had been designated by David. He broke ground on the second day in the second month of the fourth year of his rule. These are the dimensions that Solomon set for the construction of the house of God, 90 feet long and 30 feet wide. The porch in front stretched the width of the building, that is, 30 feet, and it was 30 feet high. The interior was gold-plated. He paneled the main hall with cypress and veneered it with fine gold engraved with palm tree and chain designs. He decorated the building with precious stones and gold from Parvain. Everything was coated with gold veneer, rafters, door frames, walls, and doors. Cherubim were engraved on the walls. He made the Holy of Holies a cube, thirty feet wide, long, and high. It was veneered with 600 talents, something over 22 tons, of gold. The gold nails weighed 50 shekels, a little over a pound. The upper rooms were also veneered in gold. He made two sculptures of cherubim, gigantic angel-like figures, for the Holy of Holies, both veneered with gold. The combined wingspread of the side-by-side -side cherubim, each wing measuring seven and a half feet, stretched from wall to wall, thirty feet. They stood erect facing the main hall. He fashioned the curtain of violet, purple, and crimson fabric and worked a cherub design into it. He made two huge freestanding pillars, each fifty-two feet tall, their capitals extending another seven and a half feet. The top of each pillar was set off with an elaborate filigree of chains, like necklaces, from which hung a hundred pomegranates. He placed the pillars in front of the temple, one on the right, and the other on the left. The right pillar he named Jachin, security, and the left pillar he named Boaz, stability. He made the bronze altar thirty feet long, thirty feet wide, and ten feet high. He made a sea, an immense round basin of cast metal fifteen feet in diameter, seven and a half feet high, and forty-five feet in circumference. Just under the rim, there were two parallel bands of something like bulls, ten to each foot and a half. The figures were cast in one piece with the sea. 
The sea was set on twelve bulls, three facing north, three facing west, three facing south, and three facing east. All the bulls faced outward and supported the sea on their hindquarters. The sea was three inches thick and flared at the rim like a cup, or a lily. It held about 18,000 gallons. He made ten wash basins, five set on the right and five on the left, for rinsing the things used for the whole burnt offerings. The priests washed themselves in the sea. He made ten gold lampstands, following the specified pattern, and placed five on the right and five on the left. He made ten tables and set five on the right and five on the left. He also made a hundred gold bowls. He built a courtyard especially for the priests and then the great court and doors for the court. The doors were covered with bronze. He placed the sea on the right side of the temple at the southeast corner. He also made ash buckets, shovels, and bowls and that about wrapped it up, Huram completed the work he had contracted to do for King Solomon, two pillars, two bull-shaped capitals for the tops of the pillars, two decorative filigrees for the capitals, four hundred pomegranates for the filigrees, a double row of pomegranates for each filigree, ten washstands with their basins, one sea and the twelve bowls under it, miscellaneous buckets, forks, shovels, and bowls. All these artifacts that Huramabi made for King Solomon for the Temple of God were made of burnished bronze. The king had them cast in clay in a foundry on the Jordan plain between Sukkis and Zarethan. These artifacts were never weighed, there were far too many. Nobody has any idea how much bronze was used. Solomon was also responsible for the furniture and accessories in the Temple of God, the gold altar, the tables that held the bread of the presence, the lampstands of pure gold with their lamps, to be lighted before the inner sanctuary, the Holy of Holies, the gold flowers, lamps, and tongs, all solid gold, the gold wick trimmers, bowls, ladles, and censers, the gold doors of the temple, doors to the Holy of Holies, and the doors to the main sanctuary. That completed the work King Solomon did on the Temple of God. He then brought in the holy offerings of his father David, the silver and the gold and the artifacts. He placed them all in the treasury of God's temple. Bringing all this to a climax, Solomon got all the leaders together in Jerusalem, all the chiefs of tribes and the family patriarchs, to move the chest of the covenant of God from Zion and install it in the temple. All the men of Israel assembled before the king on the feast day of the seventh month, the Feast of Booths. When all the leaders of Israel were ready, the Levites took up the chest. They carried the chest, the tent of meeting, and all the sacred things in the tent used in worship. The priests, all Levites, carried them. King Solomon and the entire congregation of Israel were there before the chest, worshipping and sacrificing huge numbers of sheep and cattle, so many that no one could keep track. The priests brought the chest of the covenant of God to its place in the inner sanctuary, the Holy of Holies, under the wings of the cherubim. The outspread wings of the cherubim formed a canopy over the chest and its poles. The ends of the poles were so long that they stuck out from the entrance of the inner sanctuary, but were not noticeable further out, they're still there today. There was nothing in the chest itself but the two stone tablets that Moses had placed in it at Horeb where God made a covenant with Israel after bringing them up from Egypt. The priests then left the holy place. All the priests there were consecrated, regardless of rank or assignment, and all the Levites who were musicians were there, Azaph, Heman, Jeduthun, and their families, dressed in their worship robes, the choir and orchestra assembled on the east side of the altar and were joined by 120 priests blowing trumpets. The choir and trumpets made one voice of praise and thanks to God, 
orchestra and choir in perfect harmony singing and playing praise to God, yes. God is good. His loyal love goes on forever. Then a billowing cloud filled the temple of God. The priests couldn't even carry out their duties because of the cloud, the glory of God, that filled the temple of God. Then Solomon said, God said he would dwell in a cloud. But I've built a temple most splendid. A place for you to live in forever. The king then turned to face the congregation that had come together and blessed them. Blessed be God, the God of Israel, who spoke personally to my father David. Now he has done what he promised when he said, From the day I brought my people Israel up from Egypt, I haven't set apart one city among the tribes of Israel in which to build a temple to honor my name, or chosen one person to be the leader. But now I have chosen both a city and a person, Jerusalem for honoring my name and David to lead my people Israel. My father David very much wanted to build a temple honoring the name of God, the God of Israel, but God told him, it was good that you wanted to build a temple in my honor, most commendable. But you are not the one to do it. Your son, who will carry on your dynasty, will build it for my name. And now you see the promise completed. God has done what he said he would do, I have succeeded David my father and now rule Israel, and I have built a temple to honor God, the God of Israel, and have secured a place for the chest that holds the covenant of God, the covenant he made with the people of Israel. Before the entire congregation of Israel, Solomon took his position at the altar of God and stretched out his hands. Solomon had made a bronze dais seven and a half feet square and four and a half feet high and placed it inside the court, that's where he now stood. Then he knelt in full view of the whole congregation, stretched his hands to heaven, and prayed, God, O God of Israel, there is no God like you in the skies above or on the earth below, who unswervingly keeps covenant with his servants and unfailingly loves them while they sincerely live in obedience to your way. You kept your word to David my father, your promise. You did exactly what you promised, every detail. The proof is before us today, keep it up, God, O God of Israel. Continue to keep the promises you made to David my father when you said, you'll always have a descendant to represent my rule on Israel's throne, on the one condition that your sons are as careful to live obediently in my presence as you have. O God, God of Israel, let this all happen. Confirm and establish it. Can it be that God will actually move into our neighborhood? Why, the cosmos itself isn't large enough to give you breathing room, let alone this temple I've built. Even so, I'm bold to ask, pay attention to these my prayers, both intercessory and personal, O oh God, my God. Listen to my prayers, energetic and devout, that I'm setting before you right now. Keep your eyes open to this temple day and night, this place you promised to dignify with your name. And listen to the prayers that I pray in this place. And listen to your people Israel when they pray at this place. Listen from your home in heaven. And when you hear, forgive. When someone hurts a neighbor and promises to make things right, and then comes and repeats the promise before your altar in this temple. Listen from heaven and act. Judge your servants, making the offender pay for the offense. And set the offended free. Dismissing all charges. When your people Israel are beaten by an enemy because they've sinned against you, but then turn to you and acknowledge your rule in prayers desperate and devout in this temple, listen from your home in heaven. Forgive the sin of your people Israel. Return them to the land you gave to them and their ancestors. When the skies shrivel up and there is no rain because your people have sinned against you, but then they pray at this place, acknowledging your rule and quit their sins because you have scourged them, listen from your home in heaven. 
Forgive the sins of your servants, your people Israel. Then start over with them. Train them to live right and well. Send rain on the land. You gave as inheritance to your people. When disasters strike, famine or catastrophe, crop failure or disease, locust or beetle, or when an enemy attacks their defenses, calamity of any sort, any prayer that's prayed from anyone at all among your people Israel, their hearts penetrated by disaster, hands and arms thrown out for help to this temple, listen from your home in heaven, forgive and reward us, reward each life and circumstance. For you know each life from the inside. You're the only one with such inside knowledge. So they'll live before you in lifelong reverence and believing. Obedience on this land you gave our ancestors. And don't forget the foreigner who is not a member of your people Israel but has come from a far country because of your reputation, people are going to be attracted here by your great reputation, your wonderworking power, and who come to pray to this temple. Listen from your home in heaven. And honor the prayers of the foreigner. So that people all over the world will know who you are and what you're like and live in reverent obedience before you just as your own people Israel do so they'll know that you personally make this temple that I've built what it is when your people go to war against their enemies at the time and place you send them and they pray to God toward the city you chose and the temple I've built to honor your name listen from heaven to what they pray and ask for and do what is right for them. When they sin against you, and they certainly will, there's no one without sin, and in anger you turn them over to the enemy and they are taken captive to the enemy's land, whether far or near, but repent in the country of their captivity and pray with changed hearts in their exile, we've sinned, we've done wrong, we've been most wicked, and turn back to you heart and soul in the land of the enemy who conquered them and pray to you toward their homeland, the land you gave their ancestors, toward the city you chose, and this temple I have built to the honor of your name, listen from your home in heaven, to their prayers desperate and devout. Do what is best for them. Forgive your people who have sinned against you. And now, dear God, be alert and attentive to prayer, all prayer, offered in this place. Up, God, enjoy your new place of quiet repose. You and your mighty covenant chest. Dress your priests up in salvation clothes. Let your holy people celebrate goodness. And don't, God, back out on your anointed ones. Keep in mind the love promised to David your servant. When Solomon finished praying, a bolt of lightning out of heaven struck the whole burnt offering and sacrifices and the glory of God filled the temple. The glory was so dense that the priests couldn't get in, God so filled the temple that there was no room for the priests. When all Israel saw the fire fall from heaven and the glory of God fill the temple, they fell on their knees, bowed their heads, and worshipped, thanking God, yes. God is good. His love never quits. Then the king and all Israel worshipped, offering sacrifices to God. King Solomon worshipped by sacrificing 22,000 cattle and 120,000 sheep at the dedication of the temple. The priests were all on duty, the choir and orchestra of Levites that David had provided for singing and playing anthems to the praise and love of God were all there, across the courtyard the priests blew trumpets. All Israelites were on their feet. Solomon set apart the central area of the courtyard in front of God's temple for sacred use and there sacrificed the whole burnt offerings, grain offerings, and fat from the peace offerings, the bronze altar was too small to handle all these offerings. This is how Solomon kept the great autumn feast of booths. For seven days there were people there all the way from the far northeast, the entrance to Hamath, 
to the far southwest, the brook of Egypt, a huge congregation. They started out celebrating for seven days, and then did it for another seven days, a week for dedicating the altar and another for the feast itself, two solid weeks of celebration. On the twenty-third day of the seventh month Solomon dismissed his congregation. They left rejoicing, exuberant over all the good God had done for David and Solomon and his people Israel. Solomon completed building the temple of God and the royal palace, the projects he had set his heart on doing. Everything was done, success. Satisfaction. God appeared to Solomon that very night and said, I accept your prayer, yes, I have chosen this place as a temple for sacrifice, a house of worship. If I ever shut off the supply of rain from the skies or order the locusts to eat the crops or send a plague on my people, and my people, my God-defined people, respond by humbling themselves, praying, seeking my presence, and turning their backs on their wicked lives, I'll be there ready for you, I'll listen from heaven, forgive their sins, and restore their land to health. From now on I'm alert day and night to the prayers offered at this place. Believe me, I've chosen and sanctified this temple that you have built, my name is stamped on it forever, my eyes are on it and my heart in it always. As for you, if you live in my presence as your father David lived, pure in heart and action, living the life I've set out for you, attentively obedient to my guidance and judgments, then I'll back your kingly rule over Israel, make it a sure thing on a sure foundation. The same covenant guarantee I gave to David your father I'm giving to you, namely, you can count on always having a descendant on Israel's throne. But if you or your sons betray me, ignoring my guidance and judgments, taking up with alien gods by serving and worshipping them, then the guarantee is off, I'll wipe Israel right off the map and repudiate this temple I've just sanctified to honor my name. And Israel will be nothing but a bad joke among the peoples of the world. And this temple, splendid as it now is, will become an object of contempt, tourists will shake their heads, saying, what happened here? What's the story behind these ruins? Then they'll be told, the people who used to live here betrayed their God, the very God who rescued their ancestors from Egypt, they took up with alien gods, worshipping and serving them. That's what's behind this God-visited devastation. At the end of twenty years, Solomon had quite a list of accomplishments. He had, built the temple of God in his own palace, rebuilt the cities that Hiram had given him and colonized them with Israelites, marched on Hamath Zobah and took it, fortified Tadmor in the desert and all the store cities he had founded in Hamath, built the fortress cities Upper Beth Horon and Lower Beth Horon, complete with walls, gates, and bars, built Balath and store cities, built chariot cities for his horses. Solomon built impulsively and extravagantly, whenever a whim took him. And in Jerusalem, in Lebanon, wherever he fancied. The remnants from the original inhabitants of the land, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites, all non-Israelites, survivors of the holy wars, were rounded up by Solomon for his gangs of slave labor. The policy is in effect today. But true Israelites were not treated this way, they were used in his army and administration, government leaders and commanders of his chariots and charioteers. They were also the project managers responsible for Solomon's building operations, 250 in all in charge of the workforce. Solomon brought Pharaoh's daughter from the city of David to a house built especially for her, because, he said, my wife cannot live in the house of David king of Israel, for the areas in which the chest of God has entered are sacred. Then Solomon offered whole burnt offerings to God on the altar of God that he had built in front of the temple porch. He kept to the regular schedule of worship set down by Moses, Sabbaths, new moons, 
and the three annual feasts of unraised bread, Passover, Weeks, Pentecost, and Booths. He followed the practice of his father David in setting up groups of priests carrying out the work of worship, with the Levites assigned to lead the sacred music for praising God and to assist the priests in the daily worship, he assigned security guards to be on duty at each gate, that's what David the man of God had ordered. The king's directions to the priests and Levites and financial stewards were kept right down to the fine print, no innovations, including the treasuries. All that Solomon set out to do, from the groundbreaking of the temple of God to its finish, was now complete. Then Solomon went to Ezion Geber and Elath on the coast of Edom. Hiram sent him ships and with them veteran sailors. Joined by Solomon's men they sailed to Ophir, in East Africa, loaded on fifteen tons of gold, and brought it back to King Solomon. The Queen of Sheba heard of Solomon's reputation and came to Jerusalem to put his reputation to the test, asking all the tough questions. She made a showy entrance, an impressive retinue of attendants and camels loaded with perfume and much gold and precious stones. She emptied her heart to Solomon, talking over everything she cared about. And Solomon answered everything she put to him, nothing stumped him. When the Queen of Sheba experienced for herself Solomon's wisdom and saw with her own eyes the palace he had built, the meals that were served, the impressive array of court officials, the sharply dressed waiters, the cupbearers, and then the elaborate worship extravagant with whole burnt offerings at the Temple of God, it all took her breath away. She said to the king, It's all true. Your reputation for accomplishment and wisdom that reached all the way to my country is confirmed. I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it for myself, they didn't exaggerate. Such wisdom and elegance, far more than I could ever have imagined. Lucky the men and women who work for you, getting to be around you every day and hear your wise words firsthand. And blessed be your God who has taken such a liking to you making you king. Clearly, God's love for Israel is behind this, making you king to keep a just order and nurture a God-pleasing people. She then gave the king four and a half tons of gold and sack after sack of spices and precious stones. There hasn't been a cargo of spices like the shipload the Queen of Sheba brought to King Solomon. The ships of Hiram also imported gold from Ophir along with fragrant sandalwood and expensive gems. The king used the sandalwood for fine cabinetry in the Temple of God and the Royal Palace, and for making harps and dulcimers for the musicians. Nothing like that shipment of sandalwood has been seen since. King Solomon, for his part, gave the Queen of Sheba all her heart's desire, everything she asked for she took away more than she brought. Satisfied, she returned home with her train of servants. Solomon received twenty-five tons of gold annually. This was above and beyond the taxes and profit on trade with merchants and traders. All kings of Arabia and various and assorted governors also brought silver and gold to Solomon. King Solomon crafted 200 body-length shields of hammered gold, about 15 pounds of gold to each shield, and about 300 small shields about half that size. He stored the shields in the house of the forest of Lebanon. The king made a massive throne of ivory with a veneer of gold. The throne had six steps leading up to it with an attached footstool of gold. The armrests on each side were flanked by lions. Lions, twelve of them, were placed at either end of the six steps. There was no throne like it in any other kingdom. King Solomon's chalices and tankards were made of gold, and all the dinnerware and serving utensils in the house of the forest of Lebanon were pure gold. Nothing was made of silver, Silver was considered common and cheap in the time of Solomon. The king's ships, manned by Hiram's sailors, 
made a round trip to Tarshish every three years, returning with a cargo of gold, silver, and ivory, apes and peacocks. King Solomon was richer and wiser than all the kings of the earth, he surpassed them all. Kings came from all over the world to be with Solomon and get in on the wisdom God had given him. Everyone who came brought gifts, artifacts of gold and silver, fashionable robes and gowns, the latest in weapons, exotic spices, horses, and mules, parades of visitors, year after year. Solomon collected horses and chariots. He had four thousand stalls for horses and chariots, and twelve thousand horsemen in barracks in the chariot cities and in Jerusalem. He ruled over all the kings from the river Euphrates in the east, throughout the Philistine country, and as far west as the border of Egypt. The king made silver as common as rocks and cedar as common as the fig trees in the lowland hills. He carried on a brisk horse trading business with Egypt and other places. The rest of Solomon's life and rule, from start to finish, one can read in the records of Nathan the prophet, the prophecy of Ahijah of Shiloh, and in the visions of Edo the seer concerning Jeroboam son of Nebat. Solomon ruled in Jerusalem over all Israel for forty years. Solomon died and was buried in the city of David his father. His son Rehoboam was the next king. Rehoboam traveled to Shechem where all Israel had gathered to inaugurate him as king. Jeroboam was then in Egypt, where he had taken asylum from King Solomon, when he got the report of Solomon's death, he came back. Summoned by Israel, Jeroboam and all Israel went to Rehoboam and said, Your father made life hard for us, worked our fingers to the bone. Give us a break, lighten up on us and we'll willingly serve you. Give me, said Rehoboam, three days to think it over, then come back. So the people left. King Rehoboam talked it over with the elders who had advised his father when he was alive, what's your counsel? How do you suggest that I answer the people? They said, if you will be a servant to this people, be considerate of their needs and respond with compassion, work things out with them, they'll end up doing anything for you. But he rejected the counsel of the elders and asked the young men he'd grown up with who were now currying his favor, what do you think? What should I say to these people who are saying, give us a break from your father's harsh ways, lighten up on us? The young Turks he'd grown up with said, these people who complain, your father was too hard on us, lighten up, well, tell them this, my little finger is thicker than my father's waist. If you think life under my father was hard, you haven't seen the half of it. My father thrashed you with whips, I'll beat you bloody with chains. Three days later Jeroboam and the people showed up, just as Rehoboam had directed when he said, give me three days to think it over then come back. The king's answer was harsh and rude. He spurned the counsel of the elders and went with the advice of the younger set, if you think life under my father was hard, you haven't seen the half of it, my father thrashed you with whips, I'll beat you bloody with chains. Rehoboam turned a deaf ear to the people. God was behind all this, confirming the message that he had given to Jeroboam son of Nebat through Ahijah of Shiloh. When all Israel realized that the king hadn't listened to a word they'd said, they stood up to him and said, Get lost, David. We've had it with you, son of Jesse. Let's get out of here, Israel, and fast. From now on, David, mind your own business and with that they left. Rehoboam continued to rule only those who lived in the towns of Judah. When King Rehoboam next sent out Adoniram, head of the workforce, the Israelites ganged up on him, pelted him with stones, and killed him. King Rehoboam jumped in his chariot and escaped to Jerusalem as fast as he could. Israel has been in rebellion against the Davidic dynasty ever since. 
When Rehoboam got back to Jerusalem he called up the men of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, 180,000 of their best soldiers, to go to war against Israel and recover the kingdom. At the same time the word of God came to Shemaiah, a holy man, tell this to Rehoboam son of Solomon, king of Judah, along with all the Israelites in Judah and Benjamin, this is God's word, don't march out, don't fight against your brothers the Israelites. Go back home, every last one of you, I'm in charge here. And they did it, they did what God said and went home. Rehoboam continued to live in Jerusalem but built up a defense system for Judah all around, in Bethlehem, Etam, Tico, Beth Zur, Soko, Adullam, Gath, Mershah, Sif, Adaram, Lachish, Azika, Zorah, Ijalim, and Hebron, a line of defense protecting Judah and Benjamin. He beefed up the fortifications, appointed commanders, and put in supplies of food, olive oil, and wine. He installed arms, large shields and spears, in all the forts, making them very strong. So Judah and Benjamin were secure for the time. The priests and Levites from all over Israel came and made themselves available to Rehoboam. The Levites left their pastures and properties and moved to Judah and Jerusalem because Jeroboam and his sons had dismissed them from the priesthood of God and replaced them with his own priests to preside over the worship centers at which he had installed goat and calf demon idols. Everyone from all the tribes of Israel who determined to seek the God of Israel migrated with the priests and Levites to Jerusalem to worship there, sacrificing to the God of their ancestors. That gave a tremendous boost to the kingdom of Judah. They stuck with Rehoboam's son of Solomon for three years, loyal to the ways of David and Solomon for this period. Rehoboam married Mahalath daughter of Jeremoth, David's son, and Abihail daughter of Eliab, Jesse's son. Mahalath bore him Jush, Shemariah, and Zaim. Then he married Makkah, Absalom's daughter, and she bore him Abijah, Atai, Ziza, and Shelemith. Makkah was Rehoboam's favorite wife, he loved her more than all his other wives and concubines put together, and he had a lot, 18 wives and 60 concubines who produced 28 sons and 60 daughters. Rehoboam designated Abijah son of Makkah as the first son and leader of the brothers, he intended to make him the next king. He was shrewd in deploying his sons in all the fortress cities that made up his defense system in Judah and Benjamin, he kept them happy with much food and many wives. By the time Rehoboam had secured his kingdom and was strong again, he, and all Israel with him, had virtually abandoned God and his ways. In Rehoboam's fifth year, because he and the people were unfaithful to God, Shishak king of Egypt invaded as far as Jerusalem. He came with 1200 chariots and 60,000 cavalry, and soldiers from all over, the Egyptian army included Libyans, Sukkites, and Ethiopians. They took the fortress cities of Judah and advanced as far as Jerusalem itself. Then the prophet Shemaiah, accompanied by the leaders of Judah who had retreated to Jerusalem before Shishak, came to Rehoboam and said, God's word, you abandoned me, now I abandon you to Shishak. The leaders of Israel and the king were repentant and said, God is right. When God saw that they were humbly repentant, the word of God came to Shemaiah, because they are humble, I'll not destroy them, I'll give them a break. I won't use Shishak to express my wrath against Jerusalem. What I will do, though, is make them Shishak subjects, they'll learn the difference between serving me and serving human kings. Then Shishak king of Egypt attacked Jerusalem. He plundered the treasury of the temple of God and the treasury of the royal palace, he took everything he could lay his hands on. He even took the gold shields that Solomon had made. 
King Rehoboam replaced the gold shields with bronze shields and gave them to the guards who were posted at the entrance to the royal palace. Whenever the king went to God's temple, the guards went with him carrying the shields, but they always returned them to the guardroom. Because Rehoboam was repentant, God's anger was blunted, so he wasn't totally destroyed. The picture wasn't entirely bleak, there were some good things going on in Judah. King Rehoboam regrouped and re-established his rule in Jerusalem. He was 41 years old when he became king and continued as king for 17 years in Jerusalem, the city God chose out of all the tribes of Israel as the special presence of his name. His mother was Naamah from Ammon. But the final verdict on Rehoboam was that he was a bad king, God was not important to him, his heart neither cared for nor sought after God. The history of Rehoboam, from start to finish, is written in the memoirs of Shemaiah the prophet and Iddo the seer that contain the family trees. There was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam the whole time. Rehoboam died and was buried with his ancestors in the city of David. His son Abijah ruled after him. In the eighteenth year of the rule of King Jeroboam, Abijah took over the throne of Judah. He ruled in Jerusalem three years. His mother was Maka daughter of Uriel of Gibeah. War broke out between Abijah and Jeroboam. Abijah started out with 400,000 of his best soldiers, Jeroboam countered with 800,000 of his best. Abijah took a prominent position on Mount Zemaraim in the hill country of Ephraim and gave this speech, Listen, Jeroboam and all Israel. Don't you realize that God, the one and only God of Israel, established David and his sons as the permanent rulers of Israel, ratified by a covenant of salt, God's kingdom ruled by God's king? And what happened? Jeroboam, the son of Solomon's slave Nebat, rebelled against his master. All the riffraff joined his cause and were too much for Rehoboam, Solomon's true heir. Rehoboam didn't know his way around, besides he was a real wimp, he couldn't stand up against them. Taking advantage of that weakness, you are asserting yourself against the very rule of God that is delegated to David's descendants, you think you are so big with your huge army backed up by the golden calf idols that Jeroboam made for you as gods. But just look at what you've done, you threw out the priests of God, the sons of Aaron, and the Levites, and made priests to suit yourselves, priests just like the pagans have. Anyone who shows up with enough money to pay for it can be a priest. A priest of no God. But for the rest of us in Judah, we're sticking with God. We have not traded him in for the latest model, we're keeping the tried and true priests of Aaron to lead us to God and the Levites to lead us in worship by sacrificing whole burnt offerings and aromatic incense to God at the daily morning and evening prayers, setting out fresh holy bread on a clean table, and lighting the lamps on the golden lampstand every night. We continue doing what God told us to in the way He told us to do it, but you have rid yourselves of Him. Can't you see the obvious? God is on our side, He's our leader. And His priests with trumpets are all ready to blow the signal to battle. O oh Israel, don't fight against God, the God of your ancestors. You will not win this battle. While Abijah was speaking, Jeroboam had sent men around to take them by surprise from the rear, Jeroboam in front of Judah and the ambush behind. When Judah looked back, they saw they were attacked front and back. They prayed desperately to God, the priests blew their trumpets, and the soldiers of Judah shouted their battle cry. At the battle cry, God routed Jeroboam and all Israel before Abijah and Judah. The army of Israel scattered before Judah, God gave them the victory. Abijah and his troops slaughtered them. 500,000 of Israel's best fighters were killed that day. The army of Israel fell flat on its face, 
a humiliating defeat. The army of Judah won hands down because they trusted God, the God of their ancestors. Abijah followed up his victory by pursuing Jeroboam, taking the towns of Bethel, Jeshana, and Ephron with their surrounding villages. Jeroboam never did recover from his defeat while Abijah lived. Later on God struck him down and he died. Meanwhile Abijah flourished, he married 14 wives and ended up with a family of 22 sons and 16 daughters. The rest of the history of Abijah, what he did and said, is written in the study written by Iddo the prophet. Abijah died and was buried with his ancestors in the city of David. His son Asa became the next king, for ten years into Asa's reign the country was at peace. Asa was a good king. He did things right in God's eyes. He cleaned house, got rid of the pagan altars and shrines, smashed the sacred stone pillars, and chopped down the sex and religion groves, Ashram. He told Judah to center their lives in God, the God of their fathers, to do what the law said, and to follow the commandments. Because he got rid of all the pagan shrines and altars in the cities of Judah, his kingdom was at peace. Because the land was quiet and there was no war, he was able to build up a good defense system in Judah. God kept the peace. Asa said to his people, while we have the chance and the land is quiet, let's build a solid defense system, fortifying our cities with walls, towers, gates, and bars. We have this peaceful land because we sought God, He has given us rest from all troubles. So they built and enjoyed prosperity. Asa had an army of 300,000 Judeans, equipped with shields and spears, and another 280,000 Benjaminites who were shield-bearers and archers. They were all courageous warriors. Zerah the Ethiopian went to war against Asa with an army of a million plus 300 chariots and got as far as Mershah. Asa met him there and prepared to fight from the valley of Zephatha near Mershah. Then Asa prayed to God, O oh God, you aren't impressed by numbers or intimidated by a show of force once you decide to help. Help us, O oh God, we have come out to meet this huge army because we trust in you and who you are. Don't let mere mortals stand against you. God defeated the Ethiopians before Asa and Judah, the Ethiopians ran for their lives. Asa and his men chased them as far as Gerar, so many of the Ethiopians were killed that there was no fight left in them, a massacre before God and his troops, Judah carted off loads of plunder. They devastated all the towns around Gerar whose people were helpless, paralyzed by the fear of God, and looted the country. They also attacked herdsmen and brought back a lot of sheep and camels to Jerusalem. Then Azariah son of Obed, moved by the Spirit of God, went out to meet Asa. He said, Listen carefully, Asa, and listen Judah and Benjamin, God will stick with you as long as you stick with him. If you look for him he will let himself be found, but if you leave him he'll leave you. For a long time Israel didn't have the real God, nor did they have the help of priest or teacher or book. But when they were in trouble and got serious, and decided to seek God, the God of Israel, God let himself be found. At that time it was a dog-eat-dog -dog world, life was constantly up for grabs, no one, regardless of country, knew what the next day might bring. Nation battered nation, city pummeled city. God let loose every kind of trouble among them. But it's different with you, be strong. Take heart. Payday is coming. Asa heard the prophecy of Azariah son of Obed, took a deep breath, then rolled up his sleeves, and went to work, he cleaned out the obscene and polluting sacred shrines from the whole country of Judah and Benjamin and from the towns he had taken in the hill country of Ephraim. He spruced up the altar of God that was in front of the temple porch. 
Then he called an assembly for all Judah and Benjamin, including those from Ephraim, Manasseh, and Simeon who were living there at the time, for many from Israel had left their homes and joined forces with Asa when they saw that God was on his side. They all arrived in Jerusalem in the third month of the fifteenth year of Asa's reign for a great assembly of worship. From their earlier plunder they offered sacrifices of seven hundred oxen and seven thousand sheep for the worship. Then they bound themselves in a covenant to seek God, the God of their fathers, wholeheartedly, holding nothing back. And they agreed that anyone who refused to seek God, the God of Israel, should be killed, no matter who it was, young or old, man or woman. They shouted out their promise to God, a joyful sound accompanied with blasts from trumpets and ram's horns. The whole country felt good about the covenant promise, they had given their promise joyfully from the heart. Anticipating the best, they had sought God, and He showed up, ready to be found. God gave them peace within and without, a most peaceable kingdom. In his cleanup of the country, Asa went so far as to remove his mother, Queen Maka, from her throne because she had built a shockingly obscene image of the sex goddess Eshir. Asa tore it down, smashed it, and burned it up in the Kidron Valley. Unfortunately he didn't get rid of the local sex and religion shrines. But he was well-intentioned, his heart was in the right place, loyal to God. All the gold and silver vessels and artifacts that he and his father had consecrated for holy use he installed in the temple of God. There wasn't a trace of war up to the thirty-fifth year of Asa's reign. But in the thirty-sixth year of Asa's reign, Basha king of Israel attacked. He started it by building a fort at Ramah and closing the border between Israel and Judah to keep Asa king of Judah from leaving or entering. Asa took silver and gold from the treasuries of the temple of God and the royal palace and sent it to Ben-Hadad, king of Aram who lived in Damascus, with this message, let's make a treaty like the one between our fathers. I'm showing my good faith with this gift of silver and gold. Break your deal with Basha king of Israel so he'll quit fighting against me. Ben-Hadad went along with King Asa and sent his troops against the towns of Israel. They sacked Ijin, Dan, Abelmaim, and all the store cities of Naphtali. When Basha got the report, he quit fortifying Ramah. Then King Asa issued orders to his people in Judah to haul away the logs and stones Basha had used in the fortification of Ramah and used them himself to fortify Geba and Mizpah. Just after that, Hanani the seer came to Asa king of Judah and said, Because you went for help to the king of Aram and didn't ask God for help, you've lost a victory over the army of the king of Aram. Didn't the Ethiopians and Libyans come against you with superior forces, completely outclassing you with their chariots and cavalry? But you asked God for help and He gave you the victory. God is always on the alert, constantly on the lookout for people who are totally committed to Him. You were foolish to go for human help when you could have had God's help. Now you're in trouble, one round of war after another. At that, Asa lost his temper. Angry, he put Hanani in the stocks. At the same time Asa started abusing some of the people. A full account of Asa is written in the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah. In the thirty-ninth year of his reign Asa came down with a severe case of foot infection. He didn't ask God for help, but went instead to the doctors. Then Asa died, he died in the forty-first year of his reign. They buried him in a mausoleum that he had built for himself in the city of David. They laid him in a crypt full of aromatic oils and spices. Then they had a huge bonfire in his memory. Asa's son Jehoshaphat was the next king, he started out by working on his defense system against Israel. 
He put troops in all the fortress cities of Judah and deployed garrisons throughout Judah and in the towns of Ephraim that his father Asa had captured. God was on Jehoshaphat's side because he stuck to the ways of his father Asa's early years. He didn't fool around with the popular Baal religion, he was a seeker and follower of the God of his father and was obedient to him, he wasn't like Israel. And God secured the kingdom under his rule, gave him a firm grip on it. And everyone in Judah showed their appreciation by bringing gifts. Jehoshaphat ended up very rich and much honored. He was single-minded in following God, and he got rid of the local sex and religion shrines. In the third year of his reign he sent his officials, excellent men, every one of them, Ben-Hale, Obadiah, Zechariah, Nethanel, and Micaiah on a teaching mission to the cities of Judah. They were accompanied by Levites, Shemaiah, Nethaniah, Zebediah, Asahel, Shemiramoth, Jehonathan, Adonijah, Tabijah, and Tabadonijah. The priests Elishama and Jehoram were also in the company. They made a circuit of the towns of Judah, teaching the people and using the book of the revelation of God as their text. There was a strong sense of the fear of God in all the kingdoms around Judah, they didn't dare go to war against Jehoshaphat. Some Philistines even brought gifts and a load of silver to Jehoshaphat, and the desert Bedouin brought flocks, 7,700 rams and 7,700 goats. So Jehoshaphat became stronger by the day, and constructed more and more forts and store cities, an age of prosperity for Judah. He also had excellent fighting men stationed in Jerusalem. The captains of the military units of Judah, classified according to families, were, Captain Adna with 300,000 soldiers, his associate Captain Jehohanan with 280,000, his associate Amasiah son of Zikri, a volunteer for God, with 200,000. Officer Eliada represented Benjamin with 200,000 fully equipped with bow and shield, and his associate was Jehazabad with 180,000 armed and ready for battle. These were under the direct command of the king, in addition there were the troops assigned to the fortress cities spread all over Judah. But even though Jehoshaphat was very rich and much honored, he made a marriage alliance with Ahab of Israel. Some time later he paid a visit to Ahab at Samaria. Ahab celebrated his visit with a feast, a huge barbecue with all the lamb and beef you could eat. But Ahab had a hidden agenda, he wanted Jehoshaphat's support in attacking Ramoth Gilead. Then Ahab brought it into the open, Will you join me in attacking Ramoth Gilead? Jehoshaphat said, You bet. I'm with you all the way, you can count on me and my troops. Then Jehoshaphat said, But before you do anything, ask God for guidance. The king of Israel got the prophets together, all four hundred of them, and put the question to them, should I attack Ramoth Gilead or should I hold back? Go for it, they said. God will hand it over to the king. But Jehoshaphat dragged his feet, Is there another prophet of God around here we can consult? Let's get a second opinion. The king of Israel told Jehoshaphat, As a matter of fact, there is another. But I hate him. He never preaches anything good to me, only doom, 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 Micaiah son of Imla. The king shouldn't talk about a prophet like that, said Jehoshaphat. So the king of Israel ordered one of his men, quickly, get Micaiah son of Imla. Meanwhile, the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat were seated on their thrones, dressed in their royal robes, resplendent in front of the Samaria city gates. All the prophets were staging a prophecy performance for their benefit. Zedekiah son of Kanana had even made a set of iron horns, and brandishing them, called out, God's word. 
With these horns you'll gore Aram until there's nothing left of them. All the prophets chimed in, yes. Go for Ramoth Gilead. An easy victory. God's gift to the king. The messenger who went to get Micaiah told him, the prophets have all said yes to the king. Make it unanimous, vote yes. But Micaiah said, as sure as God lives, what God says, I'll say. With Micaiah before him, the king asked him, So, Micaiah, do we attack Ramoth Gilead? Or do we hold back? Go ahead, he said, an easy victory. God's gift to the king. Not so fast, said the king. How many times have I made you promise under oath to tell me the truth and nothing but the truth? All right, said Micaiah, since you insist, that I saw all of Israel scattered over the hills. Sheep with no shepherd. Then God spoke, these poor people. Have no one to tell them what to do. Let them go home and do. The best they can for themselves. The king of Israel turned to Jehoshaphat, See. What did I tell you? He never has a good word for me from God, only doom. Micaiah kept on, I'm not done yet, listen to God's word, I saw God enthroned. And all the angel armies of heaven. Standing at attention. Ranged on his right and his left. And God said, how can we seduce Ahab? Into attacking Ramoth Gilead? Some said this. And some said that. Then a bold angel stepped out. Stood before God, and said. I'll seduce him. And how will you do it, said God. Easy, said the angel. I'll get all the prophets to lie. That should do it, said God. On your way, seduce him. And that's what has happened. God filled the mouths of your puppet prophets with seductive lies. God has pronounced your doom. Just then Zedekiah son of Kanana came up and slapped Micaiah in the face, saying, Since when did the Spirit of God leave me and take up with you? Micaiah said, You'll know soon enough, you'll know it when you're frantically and futilely looking for a place to hide. The king of Israel had heard enough, get Micaiah out of here. Turn him over to Ammon the city magistrate and to Josh the king's son with this message, king's orders. Lock him up in jail, keep him on bread and water until I'm back in one piece. Micaiah said if you ever get back in one piece. I'm no prophet of God that he added when it happens, O people. Remember where you heard it. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat king of Judah went ahead and attacked Ramoth Gilead. The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Wear my kingly robe, I'm going into battle disguised. So the king of Israel entered the battle in disguise. Meanwhile, the king of Aram had ordered his chariot commanders, there were thirty-two of them, don't bother with anyone whether small or great, go after the king of Israel and him only. When the chariot commanders saw Jehoshaphat, they said, there he is. The king of Israel, and took after him. Jehoshaphat yelled out, and the chariot commanders realized they had the wrong man, it wasn't the king of Israel after all. God intervened and they let him go. Just then someone, without aiming, shot an arrow into the crowd and hit the king of Israel in the chink of his armor. The king told his charioteer, turn back. Get me out of here, I'm wounded. All day the fighting continued, hot and heavy. Propped up in his chariot, the king watched from the sidelines. He died that evening. But Jehoshaphat king of Judah got home safe and sound. Jehu, son of Hanani the seer, confronted king Jehoshaphat, You have no business helping evil, 
cozying up to God-haters. Because you did this, God is good and angry with you. But you're not all bad, you made a clean sweep of the polluting sex and religion shrines, and you were single-minded in seeking God. Jehoshaphat kept his residence in Jerusalem but made a regular round of visits among the people, from Beersheba in the south to Mount Ephraim in the north, urging them to return to God, the God of their ancestors. And he was diligent in appointing judges in the land, each of the fortress cities had its judge. He charged the judges, this is serious work, do it carefully. You are not merely judging between men and women, these are God's judgments that you are passing on. Live in the fear of God, be most careful, for God hates dishonesty, partiality, and bribery. In Jerusalem Jehoshaphat also appointed Levites, priests, and family heads to decide on matters that had to do with worship and mediating local differences. He charged them, do your work in the fear of God, be dependable and honest in your duties. When a case comes before you involving any of your fellow citizens, whether it seems large, like murder, or small, like matters of interpretation of the law, you are responsible for warning them that they are dealing with God. Make that explicit, otherwise both you and they are going to be dealing with God's wrath. Do your work well or you'll end up being as guilty as they are. Amaria the chief priest is in charge of all cases regarding the worship of God, Zebediah son of Ishmael, the leader of the tribe of Judah, is in charge of all civil cases, the Levites will keep order in the courts. Be bold and diligent. And God be with you as you do your best. Some time later the Moabites and Ammonites, accompanied by Munites, joined forces to make war on Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat received this intelligence report, a huge force is on its way from beyond the Dead Sea to fight you. There's no time to waste, they're already at Hazazan Tamar, the oasis of En Gedi. Shaken, Jehoshaphat prayed. He went to God for help and ordered a nationwide fast. The country of Judah united in seeking God's help, they came from all the cities of Judah to pray to God. Then Jehoshaphat took a position before the assembled people of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of God in front of the new courtyard and said, O God, God of our ancestors, are you not God in heaven above and ruler of all kingdoms below? You hold all power and might in your fist, no one stands a chance against you. And didn't you make the natives of this land leave as you brought your people Israel in, turning it over permanently to your people Israel, the descendants of Abraham your friend? They have lived here and built a holy house of worship to honor you, saying, when the worst happens, whether war or flood or disease or famine, and we take our place before this temple, we know you are personally present in this place, and pray out our pain and trouble, we know that you will listen and give victory. And now it's happened, men from Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir have shown up. You didn't let Israel touch them when we got here at first, we detoured around them and didn't lay a hand on them. And now they've come to kick us out of the country you gave us. Oh dear God, won't you take care of them? We're helpless before this vandal horde ready to attack us. We don't know what to do, we're looking to you. Everyone in Judah was there, little children, wives, sons, all present and attentive to God. Then Jehaziel was moved by the Spirit of God to speak from the midst of the congregation. Jehaziel was the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jeel, the son of Matania the Levite of the Azaph clan. He said, Attention everyone, all of you from out of town, all you from Jerusalem, and you King Jehoshaphat, God's word, don't be afraid, don't pay any mind to this vandal horde. This is God's war, not yours. Tomorrow you'll go after them, see, they're already on their way up the slopes of Ziz, 
you'll meet them at the end of the ravine near the wilderness of Jeruel. You won't have to lift a hand in this battle, just stand firm, Judah and Jerusalem, and watch God's saving work for you take shape. Don't be afraid, don't waver. March out boldly tomorrow, God is with you. Then Jehoshaphat knelt down, bowing with his face to the ground. All Judah and Jerusalem did the same, worshipping God. The Levites, both Kohathites and Korahites, stood to their feet to praise God, the God of Israel, they praised at the top of their lungs. They were up early in the morning, ready to march into the wilderness of Tico. As they were leaving, Jehoshaphat stood up and said, Listen Judah and Jerusalem. Listen to what I have to say. Believe firmly in God, your God, and your lives will be firm. Believe in your prophets and you'll come out on top. After talking it over with the people, Jehoshaphat appointed a choir for God, dressed in holy robes, they were to march ahead of the troops, singing, Give thanks to God. His love never quits. As soon as they started shouting and praising, God set ambushes against the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir as they were attacking Judah, and they all ended up dead. The Ammonites and Moabites mistakenly attacked those from Mount Seir and massacred them. Then, further confused, they went at each other, and all ended up killed. As Judah came up over the rise, looking into the wilderness for the horde of barbarians, they looked on a killing field of dead bodies, not a living soul among them. When Jehoshaphat and his people came to carry off the plunder they found more loot than they could carry off, equipment, clothing, valuables. It took three days to cart it away. On the fourth day they came together at the Valley of Blessing, Baraka, and blessed God, that's how it got the name, Valley of Blessing. Jehoshaphat then led all the men of Judah and Jerusalem back to Jerusalem, an exuberant parade. God had given them joyful relief from their enemies. They entered Jerusalem and came to the temple of God with all the instruments of the band playing. When the surrounding kingdoms got word that God had fought Israel's enemies, the fear of God descended on them. Jehoshaphat heard no more from them, as long as Jehoshaphat reigned, peace reigned. That about sums up Jehoshaphat's reign over Judah. He was 35 years old when he became king and ruled as king in Jerusalem for 25 years. His mother was a Zuba daughter of Shilhai. He continued the kind of life characteristic of his father Asa, no detours, no dead ends, pleasing God with his life. But he failed to get rid of the neighborhood sex and religion shrines, people continued to pray and worship at these idolatrous god shops. The rest of Jehoshaphat's life, from start to finish, is written in the memoirs of Jehu son of Hanani, which are included in the royal annals of Israel's kings. Late in life Jehoshaphat formed a trading syndicate with Ahaziah king of Israel, which was very wrong of him to do. He went in as partner with him to build ocean-going ships at Ezean Jeber to trade with Tarshish. Eliezer son of Dodavahu of Mershah preached against Jehoshaphat's venture, because you joined forces with Ahaziah, God has shipwrecked your work. The ships were smashed and nothing ever came of the trade partnership. Jehoshaphat died and was buried in the family cemetery in the city of David. Jehoram his son was the next king. Jehoram's brothers were Azariah, Jehiel, Zechariah, Azariahu, Michael, and Shephatiah, the sons of Jehoshaphat king of Judah. Their father had lavished them with gifts, silver, gold, and other valuables, plus the fortress cities in Judah. But Jehoram was his firstborn son and he gave him the kingdom of Judah. But when Jehoram had taken over his father's kingdom and had secured his position, he killed all his brothers along with some of the government officials. 
Jehoram was 32 years old when he became king and ruled in Jerusalem for eight years. He imitated Israel's kings and married into the Ahab dynasty. God considered him an evil man. But despite that, because of his covenant with David, God was not yet ready to destroy the descendants of David, he had, after all, promised to keep a light burning for David and his sons. During Jehoram's reign, Edom revolted from Judah's rule and set up their own king. Jehoram responded by setting out with his officers and chariots. Edom surrounded him, but in the middle of the night he and his charioteers broke through the lines and hit Edom hard. Edom continues in revolt against Judah right up to the present. Even little Libna revolted at that time. The evidence accumulated, since Jehoram had abandoned God, the God of his ancestors, God was abandoning him. He even went so far as to build pagan sacred shrines in the mountains of Judah. He brazenly led Jerusalem away from God, seducing the whole country. One day he got a letter from Elijah the prophet. It read, From God, the God of your ancestor David, a message, because you have not kept to the ways of Jehoshaphat your father and Asa your grandfather, kings of Judah, but have taken up with the ways of the kings of Israel in the north, leading Judah and Jerusalem away from God, going step by step down the apostate path of Ahab and his crew, why, you even killed your own brothers, all of them better men than you. God is going to afflict your people, your wives, your sons, and everything you have with a terrible plague. And you are going to come down with a terrible disease of the colon, painful and humiliating. The trouble started with an invasion. God incited the Philistines and the Arabs who lived near the Ethiopians to attack Jehoram. They came to the borders of Judah, forced their way in, and plundered the place, robbing the royal palace of everything in it including his wives and sons. One son, his youngest, Ahaziah, was left behind. The terrible and fatal disease in his colon followed. After about two years he was totally incontinent and died writhing in pain. His people didn't honor him by lighting a great bonfire, as was customary with his ancestors. He was 32 years old when he became king and reigned for eight years in Jerusalem. There were no tears shed when he died, it was good riddance, and they buried him in the city of David, but not in the royal cemetery. The people of Jerusalem made Ahaziah, Jehoram's youngest son, king. Raiders from the desert, who had come with the Arabs against the settlement, had killed all the older sons. That's how Ahaziah son of Jehoram king of Judah became king. Ahaziah was 22 years old when he became king, but reigned only one year in Jerusalem. His mother was Athaliah, granddaughter of Omri. He lived and ruled just like the Ahab family had done, his mother training him in evil ways. God also considered him evil, related by both marriage and sin to the Ahab clan. After the death of his father, he attended the sin school of Ahab, and graduated with a degree in doom. He did what they taught him, went with Joram son of Ahab king of Israel in the war against Haziel king of Aram at Ramoth Gilead. Joram, wounded by the Arameans, retreated to Jezreel to recover from the wounds he received in Ramah in his war with Haziel king of Aram. Ahaziah son of Jehoram king of Judah paid a visit to Joram son of Ahab on his sickbed at Jezreel. The fate of Ahaziah when he went to visit was God's judgment on him. When Ahaziah arrived at Jezreel, he and Joram met with Jehu son of Nimshi, whom God had already authorized to destroy the dynasty of Ahab. Jehu, already at work, executing doom on the dynasty of Ahab, came upon the captains of Judah and Ahaziah's nephews, part of the Ahaziah delegation, and killed them outright. 
Then he sent out a search party looking for Ahaziah himself. They found him hiding out in Samaria and hauled him back to Jehu. And Jehu killed him, they didn't, though, just leave his body there. Out of respect for his grandfather Jehoshaphat, famous as a sincere seeker after God, they gave him a decent burial. But there was no one left in Ahaziah's family capable of ruling the kingdom. When Ahaziah's mother Athaliah saw that her son was dead, she took over. She began by massacring the entire royal family. Jehosheba, daughter of King Jehoram, took Ahaziah's son Josh, and kidnapped him from among the king's sons slated for slaughter. She hid him and his nurse in a private room away from Athaliah. So Jehosheba, daughter of King Jehoram and Ahaziah's sister, she was also the wife of Jehoiada the priest, saved Josh from the murderous queen Athaliah. He was there with her, hidden away for six years in the temple of God. Athaliah, oblivious to his existence, ruled the country. In the seventh year the priest Jehoiada decided to make his move and worked out a strategy with certain influential officers in the army. He picked Azariah son of Jerahem, Ishmael son of Jehohanan, Azariah son of Obed, Messiah son of Adaiah, and Elishaphat son of Zikri as his associates. They dispersed throughout Judah and called in the Levites from all the towns in Judah along with the heads of families. They met in Jerusalem. The gathering met in the temple of God. They made a covenant there in the temple. The priest Jehoiada showed them the young prince and addressed them, Here he is, the son of the king. He is going to rule just as God promised regarding the sons of David. Now this is what you must do, a third of you priests and Levites who come on duty on the Sabbath are to be posted as security guards at the gates, another third will guard the palace, and the other third will guard the foundation gate. All the people will gather in the courtyards of the temple of God. No one may enter the temple of God except the priests and designated Levites, they are permitted in because they've been consecrated, but all the people must do the work assigned them. The Levites are to form a ring around the young king, weapons at the ready. Kill anyone who tries to break through your ranks. Your job is to stay with the king at all times and places, coming and going. All the Levites and officers obeyed the orders of Jehoiada the priest. Each took charge of his men, both those who came on duty on the Sabbath and those who went off duty on the Sabbath, for Jehoiada the priest hadn't exempted any of them from duty. Then the priest armed the officers with spears and the large and small shields originally belonging to King David that were stored in the temple of God. Well armed, the guards took up their assigned positions for protecting the king, from one end of the temple to the other, surrounding both altar and temple. Then the priest brought the prince into view, crowned him, handed him the scroll of God's covenant, and made him king. As Jehoiada and his sons anointed him they shouted, Long live the king! Athaliah, hearing all the commotion, the people running around and praising the king, came to the temple to see what was going on. Astonished, she saw the young king standing at the entrance flanked by the captains and heralds, with everybody beside themselves with joy, trumpets blaring, the choir and orchestra leading the praise. Athaliah ripped her robes in dismay and shouted, Treason! Treason! Jehoiada the priest ordered the military officers, drag her outside, and kill anyone who tries to follow her. The priest had said, Don't kill her inside the temple of God. So they dragged her out to the palace's horse corral and there they killed her. Jehoiada now made a covenant between himself and the king and the people, they were to be God's special people. The people poured into the temple of Baal and tore it down, smashing altar and images to smithereens. They killed Mutton the priest of Baal in front of the altar. 
Jehoiada turned the care of God's temple over to the priests and Levites, the way David had directed originally. They were to offer the whole burnt offerings of God as set out in the revelation of Moses, and with praise and song as directed by David. He also assigned security guards at the gates of God's temple so that no one who was unprepared could enter. Then he got everyone together, officers, nobles, governors, and the people themselves, and escorted the king down from the temple of God, through the upper gate, and placed him on the royal throne. Everybody celebrated the event. And the city was safe and undisturbed, Athaliah had been killed, no more Athaliah terror. Josh was seven years old when he became king, he was king for forty years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Gazelle, Zibia. She was from Beersheba. Taught and trained by Jehoiada the priest, Josh did what pleased God throughout Jehoiada's lifetime. Jehoiada picked out two wives for him, he had a family of both sons and daughters. The time came when Josh determined to renovate the temple of God. He got the priests and Levites together and said, Circulate through the towns of Judah every year and collect money from the people to repair the temple of your God. You are in charge of carrying this out. But the Levites dragged their feet and didn't do anything. Then the king called in Jehoiada the chief priest and said, Why haven't you made the Levites bring in from Judah and Jerusalem the tax Moses, servant of God and the congregation, set for the upkeep of the place of worship? You can see how bad things are, wicked Queen Athaliah and her sons let the temple of God go to ruin and took all its sacred artifacts for use in Baal worship. Following the king's orders, they made a chest and placed it at the entrance to the temple of God. Then they sent out a tax notice throughout Judah and Jerusalem, pay the tax that Moses the servant of God set when Israel was in the wilderness. The people and their leaders were glad to do it and cheerfully brought their money until the chest was full. Whenever the Levites brought the chest in for a royal audit and found it to be full, the king's secretary and the official of the chief priest would empty the chest and put it back in its place. Day after day they did this and collected a lot of money. The king in Jehoiada gave the money to the managers of the temple project. They in turn paid the masons and carpenters for the repair work on the temple of God. The construction workers kept at their jobs steadily until the restoration was complete, the house of God as good as new. When they had finished the work, they returned the surplus money to the king and Jehoiada, who used the money for making sacred vessels for temple worship, vessels for the daily worship, for the whole burnt offerings, bowls, and other gold and silver liturgical artifacts. Whole burnt offerings were made regularly in the temple of God throughout Jehoiada's lifetime. He died at a ripe old age, 130 years old. They buried him in the royal cemetery because he had such a distinguished life of service to Israel and God and God's temple. But after the death of Jehoiada things fell apart. The leaders of Judah made a formal presentation to the king and he went along with them. Things went from bad to worse, they deserted the temple of God and took up with the cult of sex goddesses. An angry cloud hovered over Judah and Jerusalem because of this sin. God sent prophets to straighten them out, warning of judgment. But nobody paid attention. Then the Spirit of God moved Zechariah son of Jehoiada the priest to speak up, God's word, why have you deliberately walked away from God's commandments? You can't live this way. If you walk out on God, he'll walk out on you. But they worked out a plot against Zechariah, and with the complicity of the king, he actually gave the order, they murdered him, pelting him with rocks, right in the court of the temple of God. That's the thanks King Josh showed the loyal Jehoiada, the priest who had made him king. He murdered Jehoiada's son. 
Zechariah's last words were, Look, God. Make them pay for this. A year or so later Aramean troops attacked Josh. They invaded Judah and Jerusalem, massacred the leaders, and shipped all their plunder back to the king in Damascus. The Aramean army was quite small, but God used them to wipe out Josh's large army, their punishment for deserting God, the God of their ancestors. Arameans implemented God's judgment against Josh. They left Josh badly wounded and his own servants finished him off, it was a palace conspiracy, avenging the murder of the son of Jehoiada the priest. They killed him in his bed. Afterward they buried him in the city of David, but he was not honored with a grave in the royal cemetery. The temple conspirators were Zabad, whose mother was Shimeth from Ammon, and Jehozabad, whose mother was Shimrith from Moab. The story of his sons, the many sermons preached to Josh, and the account of his repairs on the temple of God can be found contained in the commentary on the royal history Amaziah, Josh's son, was the next king. Amaziah was 25 years old when he became king and reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother was Jehodan from Jerusalem. He lived well before God, doing the right thing for the most part. But he wasn't wholeheartedly devoted to God. When he had the affairs of the kingdom well in hand, he executed the palace guard who had assassinated his father the king. But he didn't kill the sons of the assassins, he was mindful of what God commanded in the revelation of Moses, that parents shouldn't be executed for their children's sins, nor children for their parents. We each pay personally for our sins. Amaziah organized Judah and sorted out Judah and Benjamin by families and by military units. Men twenty years and older had to register, they ended up with 300,000 judged capable of military service. In addition he hired 100,000 soldiers from Israel in the north at a cost of about four and a half tons of silver. A holy man showed up and said, No, O king, don't let those northern Israelite soldiers into your army, God is not on their side, nor with any of the Ephraimites. Instead, you go by yourself and be strong. God and God only has the power to help or hurt your cause. But Amaziah said to the holy man, But what about all this money, these tons of silver I have already paid out to hire these men? God's help is worth far more to you than that, said the holy man. So Amaziah fired the soldiers he had hired from the north and sent them home. They were very angry at losing their jobs and went home seething. But Amaziah was optimistic. He led his troops into the Valley of Salt and killed 10,000 men of Seir. They took another 10,000 as prisoners, led them to the top of the rock, and pushed them off a cliff. They all died in the fall, smashed on the rocks. But the troops Amaziah had dismissed from his army, angry over their lost opportunity for plunder, rampaged through the towns of Judah all the way from Samaria to Beth Horon, killing 3,000 people and taking much plunder. On his return from the destruction of the Edomites, Amaziah brought back the gods of the men of Seir and installed them as his own gods, worshipping them and burning incense to them. That ignited God's anger, a fiery blast of God's wrath put into words by a God-sent prophet, What is this? Why on earth would you pray to inferior gods who couldn't so much as help their own people from you, gods weaker than Amaziah? Amaziah interrupted him, Did I ask for your opinion? Shut up or get thrown out. The prophet quit speaking, but not before he got in one last word, I have it on good authority. God has made up his mind to throw you out because of what you've done, and because you wouldn't listen to me. One day Amaziah sent envoys to Jehosh son of Jehoahaz, the son of Jehu, king of Israel, challenging him to a fight, Come and meet with me, I dare you. 
Let's have it out face to face. Jehosh king of Israel replied to Amaziah king of Judah, One day a thistle in Lebanon sent word to a cedar in Lebanon, Give your daughter to my son in marriage. But then a wild animal of Lebanon passed by and stepped on the thistle, crushing it. Just because you've defeated Edom in battle, you now think you're a big shot. Go ahead and be proud, but stay home. Why press your luck? Why bring defeat on yourself and Judah? Amaziah wouldn't take no for an answer, God had already decided to let Jehosh defeat him because he had defected to the gods of Edom. So Jehosh king of Israel came on ahead and confronted Amaziah king of Judah. They met at Beth Shemesh, a town of Judah. Judah was thoroughly beaten by Israel, all the soldiers straggled home in defeat. Jehosh king of Israel captured Amaziah king of Judah, the son of Josh, the son of Ahaziah, at Beth Shemesh. But Jehosh didn't stop at that, he went on to attack Jerusalem. He demolished the wall of Jerusalem all the way from the Ephraim gate to the corner gate, a stretch of about 600 feet. He looted the gold, silver, and furnishings, anything he found that was worth taking, from both the palace and the temple of God, and, for good measure, he took hostages. Then he returned to Samaria. Amaziah son of Josh king of Judah continued as king fifteen years after the death of Jehosh son of Jehoahaz king of Israel. The rest of the life and times of Amaziah from start to finish is written in the royal annals of the kings of Judah and Israel. During those last days, after Amaziah had defected from God, they cooked up a plot against Amaziah in Jerusalem, and he had to flee to Lachish. But they tracked him down in Lachish and killed him there. They brought him back on horseback and buried him in Jerusalem with his ancestors in the city of David. The people of Judah then took Isaiah, who was only sixteen years old, and made him king in place of his father Amaziah. The first thing he did after his father was dead and buried was to recover Elath for Judah and rebuild it. Isaiah was sixteen years old when he became king and reigned for fifty-two years in Jerusalem. His mother was Jechaliah from Jerusalem. He behaved well in the eyes of God, following in the footsteps of his father Amaziah. He was a loyal seeker of God. He was well trained by his pastor and teacher Zechariah to live in reverent obedience before God, and for as long as Zechariah lived, Isaiah lived a godly life. And God prospered him. He ventured out and fought the Philistines, breaking into the fortress cities of Gath, Jabna, and Ashdod. He also built settlements around Ashdod and other Philistine areas. God helped him in his wars with the Philistines, the Arabs in Gerbal, and the Munites. The Ammonites also paid tribute. Isaiah became famous, his reputation extending all the way to Egypt. He became quite powerful. Isaiah constructed defense towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate, the valley gate, and at the corner of the wall. He also built towers and dug cisterns out in the country. He had herds of cattle down in the foothills and out on the plains, had farmers and vinedressers at work in the hills and fields, he loved growing things. On the military side, Isaiah had a well-prepared army ready to fight. They were organized by companies under the direction of Jeel the secretary, Messiah the field captain, and Hananiah of the general staff. The roster of family leaders over the fighting men accounted for 2,600. Under them were reinforcement troops numbering 307,000, with 500 of them on constant alert, a strong royal defense against any attack. Isaiah had them well armed with shields, spears, helmets, armor, bows, and slingshots. 
He also installed the latest in military technology on the towers and corners of Jerusalem for shooting arrows and hurling stones. He became well known for all this, a famous king. Everything seemed to go his way. But then the strength and success went to his head. Arrogant and proud, he fell. One day, contemptuous of God, he walked into the temple of God like he owned it and took over, burning incense on the incense altar. The priest Azariah, backed up by eighty brave priests of God, tried to prevent him. They confronted Isaiah, You must not, you cannot do this, Isaiah, only the Aaronite priests, especially consecrated for the work, are permitted to burn incense. Get out of God's temple, you are unfaithful and a disgrace. But Isaiah, censor in hand, was already in the middle of doing it and angrily rebuffed the priests. He lost his temper, angry words were exchanged, and then, even as they quarreled, a skin disease appeared on his forehead. As soon as they saw it, the chief priest Azariah and the other priests got him out of there as fast as they could. He hurried out, he knew that God then and there had given him the disease. Isaiah had his skin disease for the rest of his life and had to live in quarantine, he was not permitted to set foot in the temple of God. His son Jotham, who managed the royal palace, took over the government of the country. The rest of the history of Isaiah, from start to finish, was written by the prophet Isaiah son of Amoz. When Isaiah died, they buried him with his ancestors in a field next to the royal cemetery. His skin disease disqualified him from burial in the royal cemetery. His son Jotham became the next king. Jotham was 25 years old when he became king, he reigned 16 years at Jerusalem. His mother was Jerusha the daughter of Zadok. In God's eyes he lived a good life, following the path marked out by his father Isaiah. Unlike his father, though, he didn't desecrate the temple of God. But the people pushed right on in their lives of corruption. Jotham constructed the upper gate of the temple of God, considerably extended the wall of the offal, and built cities in the high country of Judah and forts and towers down in the forests. He fought and beat the king of the Ammonites, that year the Ammonites turned over three and a quarter tons of silver and about 65,000 bushels of wheat, and another 65,000 bushels of barley. They repeated this for the next two years. Jotham's strength was rooted in his steady and determined life of obedience to God. The rest of the history of Jotham, including his wars and achievements, are all written in the royal annals of the kings of Israel and Judah. He was 25 years old when he became king, he reigned for 16 years at Jerusalem. Jotham died and was buried in the city of David. His son Ahaz became the next king. Ahaz was 20 years old when he became king and reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. He didn't live right in the eyes of God, he wasn't at all like his ancestor David. Instead he followed in the track of Israel in the north, even casting metal figurines for worshipping the pagan Baal gods. He participated in the outlawed burning of incense in the valley of Ben Hinnom and, incredibly, indulged in the outrageous practice of passing his sons through the fire, a truly abominable thing he picked up from the pagans God had earlier thrown out of the country. He also joined in the activities of the neighborhood sex and religion shrines that flourished all over the place. God, fed up, handed him over to the king of Aram, who beat him badly and took many prisoners to Damascus. God also let the king of Israel loose on him and that resulted in a terrible slaughter, Pekah son of Remaliah killed 120,000 in one day, all of them first-class soldiers, and all because they had deserted God, the God of their ancestors. Furthermore, Zikri, an Ephraimite hero, killed the king's son Messiah, 
Azrakam the palace steward, and Elkanah, second in command to the king. And that wasn't the end of it, the Israelites captured 200,000 men, women, and children, besides huge cartloads of plunder that they took to Samaria. God's prophet Oded was in the neighborhood. He met the army when it entered Samaria and said, Stop right where you are and listen. God, the God of your ancestors, was angry with Judah and used you to punish them, but you took things into your own hands and used your anger, uncalled for and irrational, to turn your brothers and sisters from Judah and Jerusalem into slaves. Don't you see that this is a terrible sin against your God? Careful now, do exactly what I say, return these captives, every last one of them. If you don't, you'll find out how real anger, God's anger, works. Some of their Ephraimite leaders, Azariah son of Jehohanan, Berechiah son of Meshillamoth, Jehizkiah son of Shalom, and Amasa son of Hadlai, stood up against the returning army and said, Don't bring the captives here. We've already sinned against God, and now you are about to compound our sin and guilt. We're guilty enough as it is, enough to set off an explosion of divine anger. So the soldiers turned over both the captives and the plunder to the leaders and the people. Personally designated men gathered the captives together, dressed the ones who were naked using clothing from the stores of plunder, put shoes on their feet, gave them all a square meal, provided first aid to the injured, put the weak ones on donkeys, and then escorted them to Jericho, the city of Palms, restoring them to their families. Then they went back to Samaria. At about that time King Ahaz sent to the king of Assyria asking for personal help. The Edomites had come back and given Judah a bad beating, taking off a bunch of captives. Adding insult to injury the Philistines raided the cities in the foothills to the west and the southern desert and captured Beth Shemesh, Ijalan, and Gedaroth, along with Soko, Timnah, and Gimzo, with their surrounding villages, and moved in, making themselves at home. Arrogant King Ahaz, acting as if he could do without God's help, had unleashed an epidemic of depravity. Judah, brought to its knees by God, was now reduced to begging for a handout. But the king of Assyria, Tiglath Pileser, wouldn't help, he came instead and humiliated Ahaz even more by attacking and bullying him. Desperate, Ahaz ransacked the temple of God, the royal palace, and every other place he could think of, scraping together everything he could, and gave it to the king of Assyria, and got nothing in return, not a bit of help. But King Ahaz didn't learn his lesson, at the very time that everyone was turning against him, he continued to be against God. He offered sacrifices to the gods of Damascus. He had just been defeated by Damascus, he thought, if I worship the gods who helped Damascus, those gods just might help me, too. But things only went from bad to worse, first Ahaz in ruins and then the country. He cleaned out the temple of God of everything useful and valuable, boarded up the doors of the temple, and then went out and set up pagan shrines for his own use all over Jerusalem. And not only in Jerusalem, but all over Judah, neighborhood shrines for worshipping any and every god on sale. And was God ever angry? The rest of Ahaz's infamous life, all that he did from start to finish, is written in the royal annals of the kings of Judah and Israel. When Ahaz died, they buried him in Jerusalem, but he was not honored with a burial in the cemetery of the kings. His son Hezekiah was the next king. Hezekiah became king when he was 25 years old and was king in Jerusalem for 29 years. His mother was Abijah daughter of Zechariah. In God's opinion he was a good king, he kept to the standards of his ancestor David. In the first month of the first year of his reign, Hezekiah, having first repaired the doors of the temple of God, threw them open to the public. 
He assembled the priests and Levites in the court on the east side and said, Levites, listen. Consecrate yourselves and consecrate the temple of God, give this much defiled place a good house cleaning. Our ancestors went wrong and lived badly before God, they discarded him, turned away from this house where we meet with God, and walked off. They boarded up the doors, turned out the lights, and cancelled all the acts of worship of the God of Israel in the holy temple. And because of that, God's anger flared up and he turned those people into a public exhibit of disaster, a moral history lesson, look and read. This is why our ancestors were killed, and this is why our wives and sons and daughters were taken prisoner and made slaves. I have decided to make a covenant with the God of Israel and turn history around so that God will no longer be angry with us. Children, don't drag your feet in this. God has chosen you to take your place before Him to serve in conducting and leading worship, this is your life work, make sure you do it and do it well. The Levites stood at attention, Mahath son of Amasai and Joel son of Azariah from the Kohathites, Kish son of Abdi and Azariah son of Jehalalel from the Merarites, Joah son of Zima and Eden son of Joah from the Jershonites, Shimri and Jeel sons of Elizaphan, Zechariah and Matania sons of Azaph, Jehiel and Shimi of the family of Heman, Shemaiah and Uziel of the family of Jeduthun. They presented themselves and their brothers, consecrated themselves, and set to work cleaning up the temple of God as the king had directed, as God directed. The priests started from the inside and worked out, they emptied the place of the accumulation of defiling junk, pagan rubbish that had no business in that holy place, and the Levites hauled it off to the Kidron Valley. They began the temple cleaning on the first day of the first month and by the eighth day they had worked their way out to the porch, eight days it took them to clean and consecrate the temple itself, and in eight more days they had finished with the entire temple complex. Then they reported to Hezekiah the king, We have cleaned up the entire temple of God, including the altar of whole burnt offering and the table of the bread of the presence with their furnishings. We have also cleaned up and consecrated all the vessels which King Ahaz had gotten rid of during his misrule. Take a look, we have repaired them. They're all there in front of the altar of God. Then Hezekiah the king went to work, he got all the leaders of the city together and marched to the temple of God. They brought with them seven bulls, seven rams, seven lambs, and seven he goats to sacrifice as an absolution offering for the royal family, for the sanctuary, and for Judah as a whole, he directed the Aaronite priests to sacrifice them on the altar of God. The priests butchered the bulls and then took the blood and sprinkled it on the altar, and then the same with the rams and lambs. Finally they brought the goats up, the king and congregation laid their hands upon them. The priests butchered them and made an absolution offering with their blood at the altar to atone for the sin of all Israel, the king had ordered that the whole burnt offering and the absolution offering be for all Israel. The king ordered the Levites to take their places in the temple of God with their musical instruments, cymbals, harps, zither, following the original instructions of David, Gad the king's seer, and Nathan the prophet. This was God's command conveyed by his prophets. The Levites formed the orchestra of David, while the priests took up the trumpets. Then Hezekiah gave the signal to begin, the whole burnt offering was offered on the altar, at the same time the sacred choir began singing, backed up by the trumpets and the David orchestra while the entire congregation worshipped. The singers sang and the trumpeters played all during the sacrifice of the whole burnt offering. When the offering of the sacrifice was completed, the king and everyone there knelt to the ground and worshipped. Then Hezekiah the king and the leaders told the Levites to finish things off with anthems of praise to God using lyrics by David and Asaph the seer. They sang their praises with joy and reverence, kneeling in worship. Hezekiah then made this response, 
the dedication is complete, you're consecrated to God. Now you're ready, come forward and bring your sacrifices and thank offerings to the temple of God. And come they did. Everyone in the congregation brought sacrifices and thank offerings and some, overflowing with generosity, even brought whole burnt offerings, a generosity expressed in seventy bulls, a hundred rams, and two hundred lambs, all for whole burnt offerings for God. The total number of animals consecrated for sacrifice that day amounted to six hundred bulls and three thousand sheep. They ran out of priests qualified to slaughter all the whole burnt offerings so their brother Levite stepped in and helped out while other priests consecrated themselves for the work. It turned out that the Levites had been more responsible in making sure they were properly consecrated than the priests had been. Besides the overflow of whole burnt offerings there were also choice pieces for the peace offerings and lavish libations that went with the whole burnt offerings. The worship in the temple of God was on a firm footing again. Hezekiah and the congregation celebrated, God had established a firm foundation for the lives of the people, and so quickly. Then Hezekiah invited all of Israel and Judah, with personal letters to Ephraim and Manasseh, to come to the temple of God in Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover to Israel's God. The king and his officials and the congregation in Jerusalem had decided to celebrate Passover in the second month. They hadn't been able to celebrate it at the regular time because not enough of the priests were yet personally prepared and the people hadn't had time to gather in Jerusalem. Under these circumstances, the revised date was approved by both king and people and they sent out the invitation from one end of the country to the other from Beersheba in the south to Dan in the north, come and celebrate the Passover to Israel's God in Jerusalem. No one living had ever celebrated it properly. The king gave the orders, and the couriers delivered the invitations from the king and his leaders throughout Israel and Judah. The invitation read, O Israelites! Come back to God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, so that he can return to you who have survived the praying kings of Assyria. Don't repeat the sins of your ancestors who turned their backs on God, the God of their ancestors who then brought them to ruin, you can see the ruins all around you. Don't be bullheaded as your ancestors were. Clasp God's outstretched hand. Come to his temple of holy worship, consecrated for all time. Serve God your God. You'll no longer be in danger of his hot anger. If you come back to God, your captive relatives and children will be treated compassionately and allowed to come home. Your God is gracious and kind and won't snub you, come back and he'll welcome you with open arms. So the couriers set out, going from city to city through the country of Ephraim and Manasseh, as far north as Zebulun. But the people poked fun at them, treated them as a joke. But not all, some from Asher, Manasseh, and Zebulun weren't too proud to accept the invitation and come to Jerusalem. It was better in Judah, God worked powerfully among them to make it unanimous, responding to the orders sent out by the king and his officials, orders backed up by the word of God. It turned out that there was a tremendous crowd of people when the time came in the second month to celebrate the Passover, sometimes called the Feast of Unraised Bread. First they went to work and got rid of all the pagan altars that were in Jerusalem, hauled them off and dumped them in the Kidron Valley. Then, on the fourteenth day of the second month, they slaughtered the Passover lambs. The priests and Levites weren't ready, but now, Embarrassed in their laziness, they consecrated themselves and brought whole burnt offerings to the temple of God. Ready now, they stood at their posts as designated by the revelation of Moses the holy man, the priests sprinkled the blood the Levites handed to them. 
because so many in the congregation had not properly prepared themselves by consecration and so were not qualified, the Levites took charge of the slaughter of the Passover lamb so that they would be properly consecrated to God. There were a lot of people, especially those from Ephraim, Manasseh, Issachar, and Zebulun, who did not eat the Passover meal because they had not prepared themselves adequately. Hezekiah prayed for these as follows, May God who is all good, pardon and forgive everyone who sincerely desires God, the God of our ancestors. Even, especially, these who do not meet the literal conditions stated for access to the temple. God responded to Hezekiah's prayer and healed the people. All the Israelites present in Jerusalem celebrated the Passover, Feast of Unraised Bread, for seven days, celebrated exuberantly. The Levites and priests praised God day after day, filling the air with praise sounds of percussion and brass. Hezekiah commended the Levites for the superb way in which they had led the people in the worship of God. When the feast and festival, that glorious seven days of worship, the making of offerings, and the praising of God, the God of their ancestors, were over, the tables cleared and the floors swept, they all decided to keep going for another seven days. So they just kept on celebrating, and as joyfully as they began. Hezekiah king of Judah gave 1,000 bulls and 7,000 sheep for the congregation's worship, the officials gave an additional 1,000 bulls and 10,000 sheep. And there turned out to be plenty of consecrated priests, qualified and well prepared. The whole congregation of Judah, the priests and Levites, the congregation that came in from Israel, and the resident aliens from both Israel and Judah, were all in on the joyous celebration. Jerusalem was bursting with joy, nothing like this had taken place in Jerusalem since Solomon son of David king of Israel had built and dedicated the temple. The priests and Levites had the last word, they stood and blessed the people. And God listened, listened as the ascending sound of their prayers entered his holy heaven. After the Passover celebration, they all took off for the cities of Judah and smashed the phallic stone monuments, chopped down the sacred Asherah groves, and demolished the neighborhood sex and religion shrines and local god shops. They didn't stop until they had been all through Judah, Benjamin, Ephraim, and Manasseh. Then they all went back home and resumed their everyday lives. Hezekiah organized the groups of priests and Levites for their respective tasks, handing out job descriptions for conducting the services of worship, making the various offerings, and making sure that thanks and praise took place wherever and whenever God was worshipped. He also designated his personal contribution for the whole burnt offerings for the morning and evening worship, for Sabbaths, for new moon festivals, and for the special worship days set down in the revelation of God. In addition, he asked the people who lived in Jerusalem to be responsible for providing for the priests and Levites so they, without distraction or concern, could give themselves totally to the revelation of God. As soon as Hezekiah's orders had gone out, the Israelites responded generously, first fruits of the grain harvest, new wine, oil, honey, everything they grew. They didn't hold back, turning over a tithe of everything. They also brought in a tithe of their cattle, sheep, and anything else they owned that had been dedicated to God. Everything was sorted and piled in mounds. They started doing this in the third month and didn't finish until the seventh month. When Hezekiah and his leaders came and saw the extent of the mounds of gifts, they praised God and commended God's people Israel. Hezekiah then consulted the priests and Levites on how to handle the abundance of offerings. Azariah, chief priest of the family of Zadok, answered, From the moment of this huge outpouring of gifts to the temple of God, there has been plenty to eat for everyone with food left over. God has blessed his people, just look at the evidence. 
Hezekiah then ordered storerooms to be prepared in the temple of God. When they were ready, they brought in all the offerings of tithes and sacred gifts. They put Konania the Levite in charge with his brother Shimei as assistant. Jehiel, Azaziah, Nahath, Asahel, Jeremoth, Josabad, Eliel, Ismachiah, Mahath, and Benaiah were project managers under the direction of Konania and Shimei, carrying out the orders of King Hezekiah and Azariah the chief priest of the Temple of God. Kore's son of Imna the Levite, security guard of the East Gate, was in charge of the freewill offerings of God and responsible for distributing the offerings and sacred gifts. Faithful support out in the priestly cities was provided by Eden, Miniamin, Jeshua, Shemaiah, Amaria, and Shechaniah. They were even handed in their distributions to their co-workers, all males thirty years and older, in each of their respective divisions as they entered the temple of God each day to do their assigned work, their work was all organized by divisions. The divisions comprised officially registered priests by family and Levites twenty years and older by job description. The official family tree included everyone in the entire congregation, their small children, wives, sons, and daughters. The passionate dedication they showed in bringing themselves and their gifts to worship was total, no one was left out. The Aaronites, the priests who lived out on the pastures that belonged to the priest cities, had reputable men on hand to distribute regular rations to every priest, everyone listed in the official family tree of the Levites. Hezekiah carried out this work and kept it up everywhere in Judah. He was the very best, good, right, and true before his God. Everything he took up, whether it had to do with worship in God's temple or the carrying out of God's law and commandments, he did well in a spirit of prayerful worship. He was a great success. And then, after this exemplary track record, this, Sennacherib king of Assyria came and attacked Judah. He put the fortified cities under siege, determined to take them. When Hezekiah realized that Sennacherib's strategy was to take Jerusalem, he talked to his advisors and military leaders about eliminating all the water supplies outside the city, they thought it was a good idea. There was a great turnout of people to plug the springs and tear down the aqueduct. They said, why should the kings of Assyria march in and be furnished with running water? Hezekiah also went to work repairing every part of the city wall that was damaged, built defensive towers on it, built another wall of defense further out, and reinforced the defensive rampart, the Millo, of the old city of David. He also built up a large store of armaments, spears and shields. He then appointed military officers to be responsible for the people and got them all together at the public square in front of the city gate. Hezekiah rallied the people, saying, Be strong. Take courage. Don't be intimidated by the king of Assyria and his troops, there are more on our side than on their side. He only has a bunch of mere men, we have our God to help us and fight for us. Morale surged. Hezekiah's words put steel in their spines. Later on, Sennacherib, who had set up camp a few miles away at Lachish, sent messengers to Jerusalem, addressing Judah through Hezekiah, a proclamation of Sennacherib king of Assyria, You poor people, do you think you're safe in that so-called fortress of Jerusalem? You're sitting ducks. Do you think Hezekiah will save you? Don't be stupid, Hezekiah has fed you a pack of lies. When he says, God will save us from the power of the king of Assyria, he's lying, you're all going to end up dead. Wasn't it Hezekiah who cleared out all the neighborhood worship shrines and told you, there is only one legitimate place to worship? Do you have any idea what I and my ancestors have done to all the countries around here? Has there been a single God anywhere strong enough to stand up against me? 
Can you name one god among all the nations that either I or my ancestors have ravaged that so much as lifted a finger against me? So what makes you think you'll make out any better with your god? Don't let Hezekiah fool you, don't let him get by with his bare-faced lies, don't trust him. No god of any country or kingdom ever has been one bit of help against me or my ancestors, what kind of odds does that give your god? The messengers felt free to throw in their personal comments, putting down both God and God's servant Hezekiah. Sennacherib continued to send letters insulting the God of Israel, the gods of the nations were powerless to help their people, the God of Hezekiah is no better, probably worse. The messengers would come up to the wall of Jerusalem and shout up to the people standing on the wall, shouting their propaganda in Hebrew trying to scare them into demoralized submission. They contemptuously lumped the God of Jerusalem in with the handmade gods of other peoples. King Hezekiah, joined by the prophet Isaiah son of Amaz, responded by praying, calling up to heaven. God answered by sending an angel who wiped out everyone in the Assyrian camp, both warriors and officers. Sennacherib was forced to return home in disgrace, tail between his legs. When he went into the temple of his god, his own sons killed him. God saved Hezekiah and the citizens of Jerusalem from Sennacherib king of Assyria and everyone else. And he continued to take good care of them. People streamed into Jerusalem bringing offerings for the worship of God and expensive presents to Hezekiah king of Judah. All the surrounding nations were impressed, Hezekiah's stock soared. Some time later Hezekiah became deathly sick. He prayed to God and was given a reassuring sign. But the sign, instead of making Hezekiah grateful, made him arrogant. This made God angry and his anger spilled over on Judah and Jerusalem. But then Hezekiah, and Jerusalem with him, repented of his arrogance, and God withdrew his anger while Hezekiah lived. Hezekiah ended up very wealthy and much honored. He built treasuries for all his silver, gold, precious stones, spices, shields, and valuables, barns for the grain, new wine, and olive oil, stalls for his various breeds of cattle, and pens for his flocks. He founded royal cities for himself and built up huge stocks of sheep and cattle. God saw to it that he was extravagantly rich. Hezekiah was also responsible for diverting the upper outlet of the Gion Spring and rerouting the water to the west side of the city of David. Hezekiah succeeded in everything he did. But when the rulers of Babylon sent emissaries to find out about the sign from God that had taken place earlier, God left him on his own to see what he would do, he wanted to test his heart. The rest of the history of Hezekiah and his life of loyal service, you can read for yourself, it's written in the vision of the prophet Isaiah son of Amoz in the royal annals of the kings of Judah and Israel. When Hezekiah died, they buried him in the upper part of the King David Cemetery. Everyone in Judah and Jerusalem came to the funeral. He was buried in great honor, Manasseh his son was the next king. Manasseh was twelve years old when he became king. He ruled for fifty-five years in Jerusalem. In God's opinion he was a bad king, an evil king. He reintroduced all the moral rot and spiritual corruption that had been scoured from the country when God dispossessed the pagan nations in favor of the children of Israel. He rebuilt the sex and religion shrines that his father Hezekiah had torn down, he built altars and phallic images for the sex god Baal and the sex goddess Eshir and worshipped the cosmic powers, taking orders from the constellations. He built shrines to the cosmic powers and placed them in both courtyards of the Temple of God, the very Jerusalem temple dedicated exclusively by God's decree to God's name, in Jerusalem I place my name. He burned his own sons in a sacrificial rite in the valley of Ben-Hinnom. 
He practiced witchcraft and fortune-telling. He held seances and consulted spirits from the underworld. Much evil, in God's view a career in evil. And God was angry. As a last straw he placed a carved image of the sex goddess Ashira that he had commissioned in the Temple of God, a flagrant and provocative violation of God's well-known command to both David and Solomon, in this temple and in this city Jerusalem, my choice out of all the tribes of Israel, I place my name, exclusively and forever. He had promised, never again will I let my people Israel wander off from this land I've given to their ancestors. But on this condition, that they keep everything I've commanded in the instructions my servant Moses passed on to them. But Manasseh led Judah and the citizens of Jerusalem off the beaten path into practices of evil exceeding even the evil of the pagan nations that God had earlier destroyed. When God spoke to Manasseh and his people about this, they ignored him. Then God directed the leaders of the troops of the king of Assyria to come after Manasseh. They put a hook in his nose, shackles on his feet, and took him off to Babylon. Now that he was in trouble, he dropped to his knees in prayer asking for help, total repentance before the God of his ancestors. As he prayed, God was touched, God listened and brought him back to Jerusalem as king. That convinced Manasseh that God was in control. After that Manasseh rebuilt the outside defensive wall of the city of David to the west of the Gion Spring in the valley. It went from the fish gate and around the hill of Offal. He also increased its height. He tightened up the defense system by posting army captains in all the fortress cities of Judah. He also did a good spring cleaning on the temple, carting out the pagan idols and the goddess statue. He took all the altars he had set up on the temple hill and throughout Jerusalem and dumped them outside the city. He put the altar of God back in working order and restored worship, sacrificing peace offerings and thank offerings. He issued orders to the people, You shall serve and worship God, the God of Israel. But the people didn't take him seriously, they used the name, God, but kept on going to the old pagan neighborhood shrines and doing the same old things. The rest of the history of Manasseh, his prayer to his God, and the sermons the prophets personally delivered by authority of God, the God of Israel, this is all written in the chronicles of the kings of Israel. His prayer and how God was touched by his prayer, a list of all his sins and the things he did wrong, the actual places where he built the pagan shrines, the installation of the sex goddess Asherah sites, and the idolatrous images that he worshipped previous to his conversion. This is all described in the records of the prophets. When Manasseh died, they buried him in the palace garden. His son Ammon was the next king. Ammon was 22 years old when he became king. He was king for two years in Jerusalem. In God's opinion he lived an evil life, just like his father Manasseh, but he never did repent to God as Manasseh repented. He just kept at it, going from one thing to another. In the end Ammon's servants revolted and assassinated him, killed the king right in his own palace. The citizens in their turn then killed the king's assassins. The citizens then crowned Josiah, Ammon's son, as king. Josiah was eight years old when he became king. He ruled for thirty-one years in Jerusalem. He behaved well before God. He kept straight on the path blazed by his ancestor David, not one step to the left or right. When he had been king for eight years, he was still only a teenager, he began to seek the God of David his ancestor. Four years later, the twelfth year of his reign, he set out to cleanse the neighborhood of sex and religion shrines, and get rid of the sacred Asherah groves and the god and goddess figurines, whether carved or cast, from Judah. He wrecked the Baal shrines, tore down the altars connected with them, 
and scattered the debris and ashes over the graves of those who had worshipped at them. He burned the bones of the priests on the same altars they had used when alive. He scrubbed the place clean, Judah and Jerusalem, clean inside and out. The cleanup campaign ranged outward to the cities of Manasseh, Ephraim, Simeon, and the surrounding neighborhoods, as far north as Naphtali. Throughout Israel he demolished the altars and Asherah groves, pulverized the god and goddess figures, chopped up the neighborhood shrines into firewood. With Israel once more intact, he returned to Jerusalem. One day in the eighteenth year of his kingship, with the cleanup of country and temple complete, King Josiah sent Shaphan son of Azaliah, Messiah the mayor of the city, and Joah son of Johaz the historian to renovate the temple of God. First they turned over to Hilkiah the high priest all the money collected by the Levitical security guards from Manasseh and Ephraim and the rest of Israel, and from Judah and Benjamin and the citizens of Jerusalem. It was then put into the hands of the foreman managing the work on the temple of God who then passed it on to the workers repairing God's temple, the carpenters, construction workers, and masons, so they could buy the lumber and dressed stone for rebuilding the foundations the kings of Judah had allowed to fall to pieces. The workmen were honest and diligent. Their foremen were Jehoth and Obadiah, the Merorite Levites, and Zechariah and Meshullam from the Kohathites, these managed the project. The Levites, they were all skilled musicians, were in charge of the common laborers and supervised the workers as they went from job to job. The Levites also served as accountants, managers, and security guards. While the money that had been given for the temple of God was being received and dispersed, Hilkiah the high priest found a copy of the revelation of Moses. He reported to Shaphan the royal secretary, I've just found the book of God's revelation, instructing us in God's way, found it in the temple. He gave it to Shaphan, who then gave it to the king. And along with the book, he gave this report, the job is complete, everything you ordered done is done. They took all the money that was collected in the temple of God and handed it over to the managers and workers. And then Shaphan told the king, Hilkiah the priest gave me a book. Shaphan proceeded to read it out to the king. When the king heard what was written in the book, God's revelation, he ripped his robes in dismay. And then he called for Hilkiah, Ahikam son of Shaphan, Abdon son of Micah, Shaphan the royal secretary, and Esaiah the king's personal aide. He ordered them all, Go and pray to God for me and what's left of Israel and Judah. Find out what we must do in response to what is written in this book that has just been found. God's anger must be burning furiously against us, our ancestors haven't obeyed a thing written in this book of God, followed none of the instructions directed to us. Hilkiah and those picked by the king went straight to Huldah the prophetess. She was the wife of Shalom son of Tokath, the son of Hazra, who was in charge of the palace wardrobe. She lived in Jerusalem in the second quarter. The men consulted with her. In response to them she said, God's word, the God of Israel, tell the man who sent you here, God has spoken, I'm on my way to bring the doom of judgment on this place and this people. Every word written in the book read by the king of Judah will happen. And why? Because they've deserted me and taken up with other gods, they've made me thoroughly angry by setting up their god-making businesses. My anger is raging white-hot against this place and nobody is going to put it out. And also tell the king of Judah, since he sent you to ask God for direction, God's comment on what he read in the book, because you took seriously the doom of judgment I spoke against this place and people, and because you responded in humble repentance, tearing your robe in dismay and weeping before me, I'm taking you seriously. God's word. I'll take care of you, 
you'll have a quiet death and be buried in peace. You won't be around to see the doom that I'm going to bring upon this place and people. The men took her message back to the king. The king acted immediately, assembling all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem, and then proceeding to the temple of God bringing everyone in his train, priests and prophets and people ranging from the least to the greatest. Then he read out publicly everything written in the book of the covenant that was found in the temple of God. The king stood by his pillar and before God solemnly committed himself to the covenant, to follow God believingly and obediently, to follow his instructions, heart and soul, on what to believe and do, to confirm with his life the entire covenant, all that was written in the book. Then he made everyone in Jerusalem and Benjamin commit themselves. And they did it. They committed themselves to the covenant of God, the God of their ancestors. Josiah did a thorough job of cleaning up the pollution that had spread throughout Israelite territory and got everyone started fresh again, serving and worshipping their God. All through Josiah's life the people kept to the straight and narrow, obediently following God, the God of their ancestors. Josiah celebrated the Passover to God in Jerusalem. They killed the Passover lambs on the fourteenth day of the first month. He gave the priests detailed instructions and encouraged them in the work of leading worship in the temple of God. He also told the Levites who were in charge of teaching and guiding Israel in all matters of worship, they were especially consecrated for this, placed the sacred chest in the temple that Solomon's son of David, the king of Israel, built. You don't have to carry it around on your shoulders any longer. Serve God and God's people Israel. Organize yourselves by families for your respective responsibilities, following the instructions left by David king of Israel and Solomon his son. Take your place in the sanctuary, a team of Levites for every grouping of your fellow citizens, the laity. Your job is to kill the Passover lambs, then consecrate yourselves and prepare the lambs so that everyone will be able to keep the Passover exactly as God commanded through Moses. Josiah personally donated 30,000 sheep, lambs, and goats and 3,000 bulls, everything needed for the Passover celebration was there. His officials also pitched in on behalf of the people, including the priests and the Levites. Hilkiah, Zechariah, and Jehiel, leaders in the Temple of God, gave 2,600 lambs and 300 bulls to the priests for the Passover offerings. Konania, his brothers Shemaiah and Nethanel, along with the Levitical chiefs Hashabiah, Jeel, and Josabad, donated 5,000 lambs and 500 bulls to the Levites for the Passover offerings. Preparations were complete for the service of worship, the priests took up their positions and the Levites were at their posts as instructed by the king. They killed the Passover lambs, and while the priests sprinkled the blood from the lambs, the Levites skinned them out. Then they set aside the whole burnt offering for presentation to the family groupings of the people so that each group could offer it to God following the instructions in the book of Moses. They did the same with the cattle. They roasted the Passover lamb according to the instructions and boiled the consecrated offerings in pots and kettles and pans and promptly served the people. After the people had eaten the holy meal, the Levites served themselves and the Aaronite priests, the priests were busy late into the night making the offerings at the altar. The Azaph singers were all in their places following the instructions of David, Azaph, Heman, and Jeduthun the king's seer. The security guards were on duty at each gate, the Levites also served them because they couldn't leave their posts. Everything went without a hitch in the worship of God that day as they celebrated the Passover and the offering of the whole burnt offering on the altar of God. It went just as Josiah had ordered. The Israelites celebrated the Passover, also known as the Feast of Unraised Bread, for seven days. 
The Passover hadn't been celebrated like this since the days of Samuel the prophet. None of the kings had done it. But Josiah, the priests, the Levites, all Judah and Israel who were there that week, plus the citizens of Jerusalem, they did it. In the eighteenth year of the rule of King Josiah, this Passover was celebrated. Some time later, after Josiah's reformation of the temple, Necho king of Egypt marched out toward Carchemish on the Euphrates River on his way to war. Josiah went out to fight him. Necho sent messengers to Josiah saying, What do we have against each other, O king of Judah? I haven't come to fight against you but against the country with whom I am at war. God commanded me to hurry, so don't get in my way, you'll only interfere with God, who is on my side in this, and he'll destroy you. But Josiah was spoiling for a fight and wouldn't listen to a thing Nico said, in actuality it was God who said it. Though King Josiah disguised himself when they met on the plain of Megiddo, archers shot him anyway the king said to his servants, get me out of here, I'm badly wounded. So his servants took him out of his chariot and laid him down in an ambulance chariot and drove him back to Jerusalem. He died there and was buried in the family cemetery. Everybody in Judah and Jerusalem attended the funeral. Jeremiah composed an anthem of lament for Josiah. The anthem is still sung by the choirs of Israel to this day. The anthem is written in the laments. The rest of the history of Josiah, his exemplary and devout life, conformed to the revelation of God. The whole story, from start to finish, is written in the royal annals of the kings of Israel and Judah. By popular choice, Jehoahaz son of Josiah was made king at Jerusalem, succeeding his father. Jehoahaz was twenty-three years old when he began to rule. He was king in Jerusalem for a mere three months. The king of Egypt dethroned him and forced the country to pay him nearly four tons of silver and seventy-five pounds of gold. Necho king of Egypt then made Eliakim, Jehoahaz's brother, king of Judah and Jerusalem, but changed his name to Jehoiakim, then he took Jehoahaz back with him to Egypt. Jehoiakim was twenty-five years old when he began to rule, he was king for eleven years in Jerusalem. In God's opinion he was an evil king. Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon made war against him, and bound him in bronze chains, intending to take him prisoner to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar also took things from the temple of God to Babylon and put them in his royal palace. The rest of the history of Jehoiakim, the outrageous sacrilege he committed and what happened to him as a consequence, is all written in the royal annals of the kings of Israel and Judah, Jehoiakim his son became the next king. Jehoiakim was eighteen years old when he became king. But he ruled for only three months and ten days in Jerusalem. In God's opinion he was an evil king. In the spring King Nebuchadnezzar ordered him brought to Babylon along with the valuables remaining in the temple of God. Then he made his uncle Zedekiah a puppet king over Judah and Jerusalem. Zedekiah was twenty-one years old when he started out as king. He was king in Jerusalem for eleven years. As far as God was concerned, he was just one more evil king, there wasn't a trace of contrition in him when the prophet Jeremiah preached God's word to him. Then he compounded his troubles by rebelling against King Nebuchadnezzar, who earlier had made him swear in God's name that he would be loyal. He became set in his own stubborn ways, he never gave God a thought, repentance never entered his mind. The evil mindset spread to the leaders and priests and filtered down to the people, it kicked off an epidemic of evil, repeating the abominations of the pagans and polluting the temple of God so recently consecrated in Jerusalem. God, the God of their ancestors, repeatedly sent warning messages to them. 
Out of compassion for both his people and his temple he wanted to give them every chance possible. But they wouldn't listen, they poked fun at God's messengers, despised the message itself, and in general treated the prophets like idiots. God became more and more angry until there was no turning back, God called in Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon, who came and killed indiscriminately, and right in the temple itself, it was a ruthless massacre, young men and virgins, the elderly and weak, they were all the same to him. And then he plundered the temple of everything valuable, cleaned it out completely, he emptied the treasuries of the temple of God, the treasuries of the king and his officials, and hauled it all, people and possessions, off to Babylon. He burned the temple of God to the ground, knocked down the wall of Jerusalem, and set fire to all the buildings, everything valuable was burned up. Any survivor was taken prisoner into exile in Babylon and made a slave to Nebuchadnezzar and his family. The exile and slavery lasted until the kingdom of Persia took over. This is exactly the message of God that Jeremiah had preached, the desolate land put to an extended Sabbath rest, a seventy-year Sabbath rest making up for all the unkept Sabbaths. In the first year of Cyrus king of Persia, this fulfilled the message of God preached by Jeremiah, God moved Cyrus king of Persia to make an official announcement throughout his kingdom, he wrote it out as follows, from Cyrus king of Persia a proclamation, God, the God of the heavens, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He has also assigned me to build him a temple of worship at Jerusalem in Judah. All who belong to God's people are urged to return, and may your God be with you. Move forward.